<clears throat> tell me why I have the Price is Right music in my head. It doesn't matter if I call it Jeopardy or anything else. The Price is Right is really the game show that I watched growing up. Welcome to Winds of Winter Jeopardy. Nonetheless, it's not even really Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> it's not really trivia per se. Uh, this is, these are discussion topics, fun discussion topics to my, to my right. Boop. Hello, discussion topics. How you doing? Look at all these squares and stuff. Um, it's almost like someone made that in Photoshop. Nice hair, Ragnar. Thanks, Minty. Appreciate that. Means a lot. Appreciate that. Got, it start, just got hot degrees out here in Sacramento and all this had to go, but I wanted to keep the top growing, so... I have a little cute man ponytail. What can I say? So, we'll take body parts for 200, Alex. That's the idea. So, let me explain how this is going to work. These are just discussion topics. Um, they're not trivia questions. So, what's going to happen is you guys in the chat can use the super chats. Any dollar amount is fine. Uh, to pick a topic. And we do have to go down in order. So we have to start with one of the top row. Once assassin or general is discussed, we can then discuss lightsabers. The exception um, is that if you want to use PayPal and make slightly, you know, 10 bucks or above something, whatever, you know, PayPal donation, uh, then you can jump the line and grab one of the ones. It's like if you want to go straight to Headless Ned, throw me 10 bucks on the PayPal and we'll do that. Or if you PayPal me, you can add your question in. See, I've got one column here uh, for, for, to add last minute questions. So that's how it works. And then once the topic is open, I'll be basically kicking around with you guys. Um, I don't have speeches on each. I have ideas about each, but um, the idea is to have it be a highly participatory thing. So we'll kick off with one topic and then I'll be checking out to see what you guys have to say about it. So. That's how we're gonna do this. Does that make sense? We, are we, uh, are we, are we here? So, and we're raising money for a new phone. My phone screen is green and warpy, and I need to buy a new phone. It's out of warranty. Uh, Apple informs me, even though their software update is what broke my phone. Doesn't matter, apparently. Still, I gotta buy one. So, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so, yeah. Uh, feel free, anybody, again, super chat, any, any dollar amount, pick a category, and we'll get this thing started. And I'll just wait patiently for that to happen. How's everyone doing? I do have Miss Cleo out. She's in a better mood today, so it should be chill. Anybody. Out of order. Yeah, it's the green phone. It doesn't call the green men. It doesn't dial the Isle of Faces. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just start with one to get this rolling. Uh, wait for y'all to get your payment information <laughs> squared away or whatever. Um, let's see. What should we pick? Minty, I'll tell you what. Why don't you pick a category? We have plots and plans, unsolved mysteries, body parts, Politics and death. There it is. I meant to, you could still pick what you could pick the next one. I, I will definitely get, uh, go ahead and throw me and we'll do that one second. So John's hair is first from K. Thank you, K. What's that avatar? Is that a pigeon? Yes. Unsolved mysteries. Cool. So we'll go with, uh, we'll go with body parts and then unsolved mysteries. So John's hair. John's hair, um, you know, one of the things we've always, and then lightsabers, cool. And so, Carsnark, this is where I asked you for help. Can you just, when, when, jot down the list, when people, okay, so see, we've got, so jot down John and then Kyle and Solved so that I can, um, yeah, easily get this going. Uh, yeah, so basically, and if you guys could, yeah, you're perfect, you're great. So, John's hair is going to be white, that's the point. Um, he's not identifiable as a Targaryen with those dark gray eyes and his dark brown hair and his stark looks that he got from Lyanna, his mom. Um, however, yeah, there's a little bit of lag, right? So there always is. Everybody's on a little different thing. So basically, 
we're waiting for the eyes to change. Like maybe they'll go, maybe those dark gray eyes actually have a little bit of purple. Because we hear that about the Targ eyes. Like Dark Star's eyes are really dark. They look black. But if you're up close, like Ariane has been up close with Dark Star because they've, uh, um, then you notice they're very dark purple actually. So perhaps John in this Dornish sunlight, those gray eyes will look purple. But I really think what's going to happen is that his hair is going to turn white. And he's going to look like Elric of Melnibene or Youngblood Raven. Or you, probably the easiest way to say is he'll look like his wolf. Because his wolf ghost is going to be inside him. So symbolically, it will make sense if his physical uh, appearance reflects that. So he will look like his wolf. He will be the white wolf. One of Elric of Melnibene's nicknames is the white wolf. Uh, so that means that essentially, uh, yeah, no, this isn't about my haircut. It's about John's haircut. So yeah, it's, so that's the funny thing about, you know, on the show, Mel resurrected him by washing his hair and we all kind of made fun of that. Uh, but actually his hair, it will be interesting. I do believe it'll turn white and his eyes will look red. If he's, if he becomes a fire white, his eyes, I think should look red. It's implied that Barrick and Stoneheart have burning red eyes. It's not super clear. But it's like, you know, red, hollow, red pits, burning. He doesn't exactly call their eyes red stars. Only Melisandre gets that. But you picture the fire whites with like red star eyes, just like the ice whites have the blue star eyes of the others. That's how I picture it anyway. So I think Elric, I think John will be Elric. Why would his hair turn white? Uh, Stoneheart's hair turned white when she was resurrected. It's just part of being dead. You know, it takes something out of you. So, give us a trivia question as well. I didn't, ha I didn't make trivia questions. I'll have to do a different trivia game a different time. Trivia is like you really got to get that shit ready ahead of time. So, what was, what was Minty's pick? Um, uh, I believe it was Unsolved Mysteries. And then we'll do, okay, and then we'll do Lightsabers. So, here, check this out. Here's, here's the high-tech part of this. So, we did John's hair. And now I'll be able to body parts come back. Boom. John's hair. And now we're going to do unsolved mysteries. So how many others? This question is based on the idea that there is a line, a throwaway line that nobody pays any attention, make one up, nobody pays any attention to, which is that uh, fi uh, white walkers have been sighted by fisher folk near East Watch. East Watch is nowhere near like White Tree and Waymar and Castle Black and all the places that we've seen others in whites. Now, it is, clo it is sort of off in the direction of the frozen shore. And we hear that on the frozen shore, they worship cold gods of snow and ice. However, this is really interesting that people are citing the White Walkers. When we're given the line early in the story, it sounds like a throwaway, like, oh, the fisher folk, blah, blah, blah. But of course, now we know the White Walkers are active. So the question is, how many are there? Are there just the six that Waymar saw? Or are there a bunch more? No, Dork Star is not a typo. It is not a typo. The guy's a big dork. Come on now. Come on now. So, um, yeah, how many? I mean, I'm not, what do you guys think? I mean, I've always thought, you know, six, and they're looking for number seven. Um, it does seem like the White Walkers, part of their vulnerability is that there, there won't be many of them, and that's why they use the Army of the Dead. I do kind of like that idea. Wouldn't mind if there was a dozen. Um, but I also question, you know, in the Ice Spiders video, I got into the idea, and yes, Ghost's eyes are described as Weirwood Red. So John would look like a walking Weirwood tree, and that would be the point. You know. He would look like Blood Raven and Elric and a Weirwood and his dog all at once. It just that's why I think it's kind of foreshadowed what he's gonna look like. So the thing about the others is that it it might be like a hive mind thing where there aren't individual others. They manifest and unmanifest. There might be a magical limit to how many they can manifest, but we don't know if those are like, you know, we're used to thinking about Lord of the Rings where the nine ring wraiths, those are all individual kings and lords from ancient day. They're all individuals who had a kingdom and gave their hearts to Sauron. Sauron. Mordor. <laughs> 
And, uh, and, and so they're, that's, you know, they become identical ring wraiths, but they were once people. The others seem to have been green men, which is different. I mean, the children brand names, the children, but we don't know if they have names really. Um, I think they say maybe their names are impronounceable that imply they have names, but you know, the children are more of, they're not a hive mind, but they're more in that collective sort of mindset. And of course their afterlife is a hive mind. So when we say that the others used to be green men, we're not sure <laughs> if the green men had names or if we're talking about like, see, we could talk about living green men at the green men watch at the night fort that are literally slain and then converted into others straight out. Or it could be that we're talking about the green man hive mind in the weirwood net. Azor High goes in there and him and Knight's Queen essentially start ripping those spirits out of the hive mind and putting them in ice golem bodies. And so the White Walkers could just be a manifestation of the hive mind of the trees, the original tree hive mind, and there aren't names. I sort of favor that idea. So I don't, I, I do think there is a limit. I don't think they can just spawn a million white walkers because why would they need whites if they could do that? And they need the craster babies, which also implies that, you know, each, each baby is like a certain amount of power or mana that they need. But I do think the others are a hive, a tree hive mind walking around outside and they don't have names i don't think so yeah that's why white walker daycare doesn't make sense okay so next up was thank you paul lightsabers and then unsolved mysteries thanks thanks for keeping it going and carl i will call on you when i get lost or behind so just if you could keep that little running list for me I'll use it a couple times probably. It just, you know, help me not get lost. Okay, so lights uh no, we can't we can't go straight to lightsabers. That's the thing. You got we got to go in order. We got to do assassin or general before we do lightsabers. If you want to skip, you got to do a PayPal, which I have my uh I have my Gmail open so that I will see PayPal's when they come in. John Haymaker had to update the credit card information. No worries, buddy. No worries. So Booner Cancun, oh, you did, you sent in a tenor. Okay, I did sort of say that. Okay, that works. We'll do that. We'll go, we'll go straight for lightsabers. We're not here to follow rules. We're here to talk about Winds of Winter. All right, lightsabers. Oh, yes, I also, I should mention, I should mention that there are daily doubles. Where's the, where's the thing here? Oh, wait, it's not updating. The Daily Double. Brow, 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 brow. Tank. Do this better. Hang on. Oh, that's much nicer. What that tank was. Yes, rest in peace, Alex Trebek. All right. And my tea's probably good. Pull that out. I actually made myself tea today. Lightsabers. So this is a Daily Double. It just means I made up the question. Most of these are user submitted. You, the listener, have submitted questions, but I filled in a couple of my own. Lightsabers. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rip the bong every time. I'll get too baked and it'll, it'll take too, I'll get lost. I'm, I, I'm, I'm tuned in right now. I've got just the right amount of praising Garth going through my veins. So, no, I don't need to drink moon tea. i not be getting pregnant like that. Uh, lightsabers. We're talking about flaming swords, obviously. Uh, I do joke sometimes about how, you know, Luke, Luke has a couple different ones, but he sometimes does have the blue lightsaber. So he's dressed in white with a blue sword. And then you got Darth Vader in black with a red sword. So much is made of Azor High's red sword. And he's dragging a line. You see all the Targs with their black and red. Darth Vader colors, the colors of Mordor. Um, so, uh, yeah. So if there shouldn't be a lag now on the screen. If there's a lag for you, just try try refreshing your stream. 
but it's not a buzz in in time thing so it's no biggie um will we when will we see flaming swords that's the question when will we see them we've got a couple of candidates okay brienne and jamie are in the cave with lady stoneheart and they've got Oathkeeper in there widow's whale is at casterly rock or king's landing it's with tommen but Oathkeeper is in that cave now i'm of the opinion that well we've seen barrack barrack lights his sword on fire with his own blood because he is powered by relore tm He's a fire white. And I always point this out on the show. It made no sense. They showed Barrick doing it over and over. And then he looks at John and he's like, the Lord of Light brought us back. You and me, we have purpose. Watch me light my sword on fire. In case this ever comes in handy for you. Because just you and me, we're the only fire whites around. <laughs> and then John never lights his sword on fire. Even when he's facing an ice dragon and an army of others and whites, he never thinks to do the thing. It's really friggin' annoying. I don't know why they they lit all the Dothraki arcs on fire, but they didn't light John's sword on fire. In the books, John will be able to light his sword on fire, as will any fire white. Okay, now, Stoneheart is a fire white, and we've seen that fire whites can make fire whites. So there's two ways Oathkeeper could catch on fire. One, if either Brienne or Jamie stabbed Oathkeeper in her stone heart. Be very sword in the stone, very comet into the moonstone meteor because Catelyn is a moon figure. She has a stone heart. So you can see the Azor Highness and Nyssa there. Catelyn obviously is not long for this world. She's a revenant. She has to be put out of her misery sometime. So if either Jamie or Brienne were to stab Catelyn in her lore powered stone heart, that sword might catch fire. Or, if Catelyn were to pass her flame of life on to either Barrack or Jaime, so they could complete some mission, and they become a fire white, then they'd be able to light their sword on fire. So that's two ways. So what do you guys think? Um, what other... Uh... Yeah, that's because fire obviously doesn't work on ice monsters, obviously. Yeah, dragon fire will melt the others, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you it will. I do agree, though, that the um, the cold winds of the others will dismay the dragons. We've seen the dragons are susceptible to bad weather. And the, the others' bad weather is magical bad weather. So I would have to think that would be effective. So what other flaming swords could there be? Well, obviously, Dawn, it's got a, a journey. You know, I've said Dark Star is going to steal it. It'll eventually get in the hands of Fagon, and then Danny will give it to John, and maybe John will use it. Um, you know, Oathkeeper. Uh, Fagon also has black fire, most likely. So at some point, Danny could get her hands on that sword after she throws down Fagon, which she probably will. We're going to talk about that. <clears throat> so, yeah, if you want, again, if you want to add your questions. If you have a question you don't see on the board. And you can see, obviously, I've got these hidden squares. There's a whole nother set of topics that I'm going to do a reveal on. I probably should move faster. But yeah, I've only shown you the first half because I wanted to keep some mystery. I've got some even better topics below. <clears throat> so yeah, Longclaw. Longclaw is another one. Oh, I got off track. What I was trying to say is that if any fire white can light their sword on fire... The problem with Barrack is that he didn't have a Valerian steel sword. Valerian steel swords are indestructible. They're made with fire magic, so to speak. So I would think that any Valerian steel sword could become a great light bringer. I don't know if there is one light bringer, like Azor High's sword is in a in the crypts or something. I don't know about that. I think any Valerian steel sword can be turned into a light bringer. And that that's what we will see. We'll see multiple flaming swords. So yeah, Oathkeeper. I eventually think Jorah will wield Oathkeeper. So it could be a situation where somebody is lighting other people's swords on fire. That, that does make a certain amount of sense. And the idea of Melisandre lighting a bunch of weapons on fire, that, that felt right when we saw that on TV. So I could see that happening. 
And yeah, John could be a more than just a fire white, obviously. A weirwood magic could be involved. And I think his body will be first stolen by the others. So he might be like frozen body, hot spirit on the inside. Looks like a weirwood tree. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a Valerian steel sword in the veil. That's a long way from becoming on fire, though. Uh, no, Jorah won't get Oathkeeper, Longclaw. Longclaw is originally the Mormont sword. So if John gets Dawn, which I think there's a lot of foreshadowing that he will wield Dawn, then he will give it back to Jorah. It felt right in the show also when we saw that, I thought. <clears throat> well, okay, let's add that one in then. Oh, I didn't think that one through. I know what I will do. Forgive this glaring, ugly double print here. It will be gone in two seconds after I just pick the right layer. Vominos. Will Bran have emotions? Yes, I don't think he's going to be the zombie that he was on the show. I think he'll be a lot more human-like. He will be changed, because I do think he's going to do a download, as I've said. He's going to download the human hive mind out of the trees so we can put the White Walker brain back in there. Because I just said, like, the White Walkers are an exiled tree hive mind, quite possibly. So let's gray out lightsabers, because we talked about that. That is a good question. Um, and that was very unsatisfying on the show, Bran becoming a robot. That didn't work very well for me, so wouldn't be surprised if that turned out not to be a thing. Yeah, not body snatched Bran, but he's definitely got a lot. He'll have a lot up there. So he will be a little more detached and a little, he'll seem older, you know, he'll seem different for sure. It'll just be more subtle. Like, the idea that Mira will have taken him all that way and then he'll just forget to thank her. Like, I don't, I don't see that. That was kind of tacky. The Great Empire of the Dawn question is kind of in here somewhere. So, uh, Carl Carsonark, where are we? Do I have any... Uh, am I behind it all or are we waiting for the next one? P&P &P for 100 Dragons, LMLX. Thanks, Tommy. Okay, so we'll do plots and plans, which means assassin or general. Assassin or general. This is about Arya. This was a good question that somebody submitted. So will Arya... Now, this is a bit of a five-year gap question... Originally, she was going to be five years older when she came back to Westeros. Because George was going to do that five-year time skip in between books three and four. Although book four became four and five, as we know. So Arya was going to train with the Faceless Men for longer. And then come back. Now she's coming back as a really messed up 12-year-old. Okay? So will she be somebody that is plotting and planning? Will she be a general... In the because her destiny is obviously having to do with the wolf pack, all of her skills are having to do with combat and sneaking around and stuff. So, you know, she's gonna be a very powerful weapon on the board when she comes back, both potentially cleaning up any wars the Starks might have to fight and then dealing with the others. Um, I, I, the foreshadowing for Arya and the wolf pack is very heavy, and she's actually already leading the wolf pack anyway in her dreams from Bravos. So when she gets back, they should be there to greet her on the shores. <laughs> you know, and they'll definitely be ready for her. So I I tend to think that there will be both. She will do some assassinations, but I think that she will be so powerful as a warg queen 
in a, as a wolf leader that by the time it comes to fight the others and we're gathering at Winterfell or wherever it is, she will be almost like a bit of a general. Um, you know, a general of the wolves, at least. I don't think she's somebody that you just dish out orders to. Like, she's in the planning meeting. She commands the wolf pack. I think Bran will command it with her. I think Bran will hop around in, in the wolves and they'll be working together. It's one of the ways we're going to get those good Stark family vibes back that we've been waiting for. She's already 13. A theory of ice and fire saying, yeah, she could, I thought, I guess she was like 11, 10 or 11 when the book started. So yeah, I guess she could be 13 by now. She won't be fit. It won't be two years before she comes back though. She's headed back real soon. So however old she is now is how old she'll be when she gets back. You know, give or take a few months. But whatever. It's, you know, she spent the last year or so at the House of Black and White having her identity erased. So she's she's not the average 11 or 13 year old or whatever. Like she's, it's a bit messed up what's happened to Arya. There's no question. Oh, you went to the concert, John Haymaker? Yeah, I know a couple people that went. Sansa and the bird pact. <laughs> I'm not sure quite what you mean there. I do think Sansa will skin change ravens and shit. Let's see here. Got some random questions. All right, I need another. I need a, I need a category pick. I might I might have. Uh, Maybe start letting my squishers pick some so we don't have any downtime. So yeah, if you're a squisher, if you're a green texted squisher, first one to name a category and I'll take it. Oh, that's right, my tea. I should save this Red Bull and drink this tea. Oh, there's a PayPal too. Let's see what we've got here. Cripples and broken things. Okay, cool. So we're adding we're adding a topic. Very good. So crippled, cripples bastard cripples bastards and broken things, which is apparently a tongue twister. Cool, Daniel, we'll do panic next. Is um, important because of the theme of the story, which, again, we've been talking about a lot recently as being reconciliation. So reconciliation is repairing broken relationships. And those are the most important things to repair. Um, so a lot of, when we look at the cripples, bastards, and broken things, the theme there is rejects, people that don't fit into society as well, people on the margins who don't fit the ideals. And so they, you know, people like Sam, he wasn't the strapping warrior that his dad wanted. Okay, so <clears throat> essentially, we're talking about the, the broken people are kind of a reflection on some of these broken relationships and some of the pain and the damage that's been passed down. Like Tyrion is consumed with his relationship with his father. Which I actually think he's Ares' son and not Tywin's son. But it doesn't matter because Tywin raised him. So just as Ned is Jon's father, Tywin will always be Tyrion's father. No matter who his genetic father is. But I think that when you look at you know Tyrion, he's carrying around a lot of hurts. And a lot of, you know, rejection complex, whatever, from his dad. So that's why he's really a broken thing. Not because of his leg. It's because of the relationship with his family. And the idea that he can't measure up. If he was accepted by his father, because obviously Tyrion has tremendous gifts. So, if, you know, we see just a couple of moments where Tywin starts to appreciate Tyrion's gifts and puts him in charge as hand in King's Landing. And you can see Tyrion eats that up because it's what he's always been craving is that, that acceptance. So it's an important theme because it ties the people uh, into the meta theme 
if you will. So the only way that those people can be healed is by sort of healing those relationships. Tyrion's got to figure out what his relationship is to his family. Or maybe he won't, because George calls him a villain. Maybe that's not the... You know what I mean? We'll see if any of those Lannisters sort any of that shit out. Right on, DB. Um, go Celtics. Yeah, I mean... That was an incredible game from Tatum. Wow. Let Steph Curry have a record for more than two weeks, eh? Eh, Jason? Kelly Johnson, Danny Boat Sex in Winds of Winter or Not Till Dream of Spring. Um, John Danny Boat Sex. Yeah, I was thinking about talking about John and Danny's relationship. But I don't think it's mostly a Winds of Winter thing because I think the winter will be falling right at the end of the book. And... I don't, yeah, I don't know if John and Danny will have made contact by then or not. I'm going to go ahead and say a dream of spring on that one, Kelly. But I'll come back to that because I've got a different question that that dovetails into. Will Dragonbinder put Victorian's mind into a dragon? I've got a Victorian question coming up. I think I have a horn question too. Um... It, it might, actually. It's not crazy. Of course, he's talking about some of the Dragon Bond theories that basically say that it works on the idea there's a Valyrian ancestor spirit inside the dragon. How do you do that? The Dragon Binder horn could absolutely be part of that recipe, Roma Steve. So I'd give that like a 33% chance, maybe. Panic. All right. Widespread panic time. And thanks again, Isabel, for the great question about cripples and bastards. Yeah, it's going to take Danny most of that book just to get back to Westeros. It truly it seems like it will. <laughs> Tywin Lannister, you are not the father. Yeah, I think it's important. The way that I see it working is that Jamie and Cersei are Tywin's kids. And Tyrion is not. Tyrion is the most like Tywin. It's George telling us nurture and not nature, kind of. A little bit. You know. Um, and then he's also, uh, when you look at Cersei, well, Cersei is obvious parallel to the Mad King Ares, which leads people to think that she is the daughter of the Mad King. Um, but I don't, I think that that is an archetype. It's a, it starts off with like narcissism and sociopathy, but it becomes completely disassociative and like paranoid delusional. And that's the road Cersei's headed towards. And then you throw in the wildfire and you can really see the parallels. So I don't think that means that she needs to be Ares' son because that's not how that works. You know, psychopaths, they just pop up in society and they, you can draw parallels between them because they are functioning in a similar way. So that is my opinion, but who knows? The secret parentage stuff, I'm never too authoritative on that. All right, uh, let's see. Where are we here? I keep forgetting what was going to do next. Boat sex. Widespread panic. Excellent. I don't know any of their songs, so I can't make a music joke. But I at least put it in there. Uh, politics, politics. I'm so sorry. I'm just getting lost on my document here. There we go. Widespread panic. So, widespread panic. This is basically the politics of winter. I've made a big point of talking, trying to visualize the long night from an anthropologist's point of view. I think that's the right discipline. <laughs> Basically, I'm saying like, well, what would it really have been like if there was a prolonged darkness that lasted for several years and there were ice demons and the dead walking and stuff? What would that be like? Well, I've called it a cultural bottleneck, meaning that whatever institutions and royal families or whatever existed before the long night 
probably didn't exist after the long night or would have had to been reformed because once the food runs out, the political authority runs out as well. You know, once it turns into everyone is starving, law and order is going to break down, it's going to get dark, dark times. That's why I don't watch post-apocalyptic movies like The Road. They're depressing. God, that movie was terrible. <clears throat> On multiple levels, in my opinion. But point is, times get rough when starvation comes. So somebody asked me, what if all the politics is essentially over by the end of Winds of Winter and we're only dealing with magic stuff in Dream of Spring? Well, I do think there will always be politics. However, we will see a certain point where you know, and this is this felt really wrong on the show when we we did the whole like, oh yeah, let's go fight the White Walkers. Then we'll go back to the war we were fighting with Cersei afterwards. That doesn't make any sense. That's not a scouring the Shire moment. Like they made the Danny Cersei thing the climax of the story, and they sidelined the White Walker plotline because they didn't know what to do with it. But they know that Cersei was really popular and that they liked turning women crazy because they're. It's a little bit misogynist, to be honest, David, David, Dan. I think it's pretty much betrayed in the way they handle the female characters. In any case, where was I? <clears throat> I think that uh, widespread panic, essentially, yes. You know, Fagon's going to take King's Landing from Cersei. Cersei's going to end up at Casterly Rock. Danny's going to be headed towards Westeros, thinking that she's going to conquer Westeros for everyone's benefit but she's going to realize that's not the way. She might try to attack King's Landing and fail, just like Stannis did. See the wildfire go off and be like, oh my God, this is horrible. And then just like Stannis, she'll hear about the threat to the north and turn north. This is all foreshadowing. It's, supposed, it's going to be a parallel, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, I think the politics will... Whatever's going on, winter's going to interrupt it. I mean, once the meteor falls at the end of the book... And the lights go off. Yeah, forget about it. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's all different. All bets are off then. So there will be widespread panic. There will be <laughs> religious zealots running around to look at the next question. There will be, um, you know, local people will at first try to take advantage of, of the chaos to benefit themselves, but once the sun doesn't come back up for a few days, everyone's going to realize, oh, this is that long night thing all of our nans told us about, right? Oh, by the way, this Pink Floyd shirt has a prism crashing into the moon, and it's got a rainbow. And of course, George uses prisms and rainbows for icy White Walker symbolism, so that's why I had to buy this shirt. Michael James, thanks for the sticker, buddy. Why don't you pick a category? Pick a category, Michael. Or I'm going to go right to religious fanatics. Third head of the dragon, that's Euron. I'm pretty certain it's Euron. How can it not be? If he's going to steal a dragon, that kind of makes him the third head of the dragon. And shouldn't one of the heads of the dragon be evil? Like, just having three teammates doesn't... I mean, that's how it was in the Conquest. But, yeah. What if Euron's evil and he steals a dragon, but we still need him? <laughs> what if that's how it happens? Michael James, pick a category for me, buddy. Praise Garth. Ghost talk.
Hey there, I just said the most interesting thing I've said all day and you'll never hear it again. I can't rephrase it. No, I was just saying thanks for coming. Are we having fun? That's all. Are we having fun? I thought this was a cool way to do some Winds of Winter action. It's basically just an interactive outline. That's all it is. Nobody's losing or winning money. But we're having fun. That's the point. And I'm a few dollars closer to having a phone without a, without a green screen. I appreciate that, PayPal. Isabel, it was a nice, chunky one. Appreciate that. So, um, I'd love to see Sam take Vuron's Valerian armor. I don't think Sam's going to fit in that armor. But uh, he might, you know, give it to his boy, Jon Snow. He'd look, he'd look handsome in that armor, for sure. Third dragon rider. See, I do think Tyrion will ride a dragon, but not as the third head of the dragon. I, I think he's going to hop on a dragon accidentally for like a moment. Like he'll get a dragon ride, but it won't be, it'll be like in the heat of the moment, it'll just happen. And we'll, it, maybe George might even leave us to wonder if he was a Targaryen and that's why he was able to. But I don't think he'll claim a dragon straight out. I think he'll like, yeah, he'll just like end up on one for a hot second. And it'll be kind of funny and crazy. Maybe he'll fall off and survive somehow, you know. So, all right. Um, what was the, uh, we had an order, uh, ghost talk. Ghost talk. This is a last minute submission and uh, a pretty good, pretty good one. So, Jamie has a vision of his mother when he's standing over Tywin. Uh, Tywin's corpse. Um, and we are all expecting John to talk to see Leanna's shade. The question is, are we really communicating with the dead? Or are these more like dreams and visions and echoes and things that people are seeing? Um, can the ghosts pass us useful information? Kind of seemed like Jamie's mom, Joanna Lannister, not Joanna. Oh, God. What's Jamie's mom's name? Tywin? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, Joanna. His aunt is Gemma, right? So Jamie's mom is Joanna. Is that correct? I'm so bad with names. It sounded like she was, if I'm recalling correctly, it sounded like she was actually the ghost, like some part of her sentience. And we kind of need Leanna to give John the 411, right? Um, so I tend to think these ghosts are real. And I also think that what Barrick is, essentially, is a ghost that was called back and glued to his corpse. The corpse is animated by R'hllor and then sort of repossessed. That was a Cleo feather. Uh, by the ghost. So I do think that ghosts are a thing. And I think they're... It, and we can talk to them. So I was talking in the yesterday's stream, you know, what if Danny can have a communication with Rayella? Somebody asked about Rayella Targaryen, and I was just like, man, we don't really know anything about her except for the horrible stuff that she suffered at the hands of Ares, her brother and husband. And that they didn't want, they were never fond of each other, but were forced to marry because of prophecy. That's all we know. So we were saying, you know, for Danny, who longs for family and is such an orphan, like, yeah, man. Maybe, what if she pops on Glass Candle Network and uh, and has a moment of communication with her mother? That would be awesome. And it would give Raelle another note in her life. All we know is the abuse she suffered. You know, we know from the outside. But we don't know, like, what the person was. So I would... This is my new favorite headcanon, is that Danny will have a moment with Riel, but that, I don't know, Riella, but maybe that's too sweet. I don't know. George does love the ghost talk. So yeah, what other ghost talk could we see? Obviously, Leanna and, and John is the big one. She's got to explain Aegon's prophecy to John and why they ran away and some, some version of that, right? Some version of that. How many others? We did how many others? Poison Paw. 
We'll do poison paw. Thank you, chicken lipstick. So this is kind of a... I apologize in advance. Cersei, in her walk of shame, cut her feet. And she was walking through every kind of filth. People were flinging dung and food and things at her. And the, it's already the streets of King's Landing and, and parts of Flea Bottom she was walking through with cut feet. So, is there a plot line where she has some sort of physical infection? Uh, George does love to do that. You know, he loves to chop people's bits off and remove their pride and humiliate them. Cersei is full of pride. He's al she's already been, obviously, humiliated in that walk of shame, which is Pretty tough scene. I mean, it's enough to make you almost feel sorry for Cersei, right? So, yeah. Is there a foot plot line? Also, Jamie grabbed her foot. It, it's a Jacob and Esau reference from the Bible. But, of course, they were twins. Cersei was born first. Jamie was holding on to her foot. So, maybe that's... The foot is important uh, in that. Or... Yeah, Laris is lurking around somewhere. Now, make your Laris jokes in the chat. Do you think John will have, what, a vision about Leanna? Yeah, no, Cheryl, John is going to talk to Leanna before he's resurrected. Like, while he's dead, he's got to finish that Crip stream, I would think. Got to. It's like this recurring dream he can't finish. So, of course, it's he's got to finish the Crip stream, and... Leanna's ghost is going to be a part of that. I, I don't think it's too simple to sit to say that's what's going to happen. Like that's what needs to happen. It's okay if we all see it coming. It's going to be awesome. So yeah, Cersei Gangrene. More men died of trench foot in World War One than casualties in battle. So it's a real thing. Yeah, no, it's the kind of thing that George might be like. Well, somebody needs to get trench foot, or else it's not accurate medieval history. <laughs> And George does have, I don't know if it's a foot fetish, but there's definitely a lot of, you're right, a theory of ice and fire. He's, I mean, you could, he fetishizes everything. Like you say, oh, food, well, boobs, lots of dicks, amputation, transformation, zombies, cannibalism, like incest. It's, he goes a lot of places in A Song of Ice and Fire. That's why it's the kind of story it is. That's why it doesn't feel cleaned up. Because it's not. <laughs> He's explored a lot of dark stuff in there. Um, not that foot fetishes are particularly dark, but you know. Yeah, he sort of... Uh, also, when you, when you do this in a serious note here, when you're looking at everything as a symbol, this is what happens. So, you know, he's not writing about anything on its own. He's thinking about what a thing is and what it symbolizes. You know... Uh, so that's a whole philosophical conversation to get lost into. But yeah, so when you talk about feet in A Song of Ice and Fire, you have to think the, the foot of the castle wall and the foot of the tree and, you know, the way that, you know, you have your feet on the ground and your head in the clouds and like all the related concepts that could have to do with feet and travel and kicking and standing and all that stuff. Like, it'll all be like, he, yeah, it's conceptually he fetishizes everything if you want to say that it's not quite the right word of course yeah so jamie loses so jamie right he gra he came out holding on to cersei's heel and he's lost his hand so maybe she'll lose her foot and that will symbolize how their connection is broken right wouldn't that kind of be poetic not poetic but symbolic it would be when will it be released? Yeah, soon. He's, uh, he's making progress. The main thing about Winds of Winter Progress is that George has written more words for it than is in A Dance with Dragons. So it's not like he's struggling to write. He's written a book's worth of material. It's just about wrapping up certain plot lines. It might be the same thing where in Winds... There's five or six chapters that got cut or, or dance. When he finished dance, there were five or six chapters that didn't fit and got cut. Cleo. I think I, 
accidentally scratched one of her new feathers. Are you okay, girl? Yeah, okay. We're good. So, um, he's, he's written a lot for wins. It's just not quite finished up. But he's, he's wrapped up a lot of plot lines for a lot of characters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I don't think he's spinning his wheels in the mud. We'll be there soon. Just don't know what soon is. Yeah, so you've got a PayPal from Jacob. What the F is your aunt up to? Well, let's talk about it, Jacob. Let's talk about it. WTF, you're on. WTF. <laughs> Definitely planning and plotting. Specifically, the question was, what is he up to with the priests? Okay, now, I think the idea, and I'll, yeah, enjoy the Cleo tale. Thanks for the Cleo emojis there. The priests are, the idea is that it's not just king's blood that's powerful. It's any blood that people, I think it's belief-based magic that George is hinting at. If people, like, why is king's blood important? Well, it probably dates back to the original tradition when the kings were all green seers and skin changers. And so it's important there because the blood is specifically tied to the magic power that makes people a king. However, to the extent that Melisandre is still thinking that like, oh, King's Blood or Summerhall, maybe this is one of the theories about Egg, you know, is that we two kings died there. So maybe that's part of waking a dragon, three kings to wake the dragon, whatever, two kings, I don't know, something. Um, the, the idea would be that the King's Blood is powerful because people believe it's powerful. It's that belief that, that makes, makes it powerful. The magic works on that belief system. Similar to, in a lot of fantasy novels, the gods don't exist if people don't believe in them. You see, that's a problem sometimes for the gods. They've only got one priest left. They've got to rekindle the following, or else the god will fade away. Uh, Raymond Feist, his novels work like that. If any of you have read Raymond Feist. So, what were we talking about? Euron. So, the, the, the priests are like king's blood. So he's, he's got Philea Flowers who's pregnant with his own son. He thinks his blood is special. So th th his child would have a lot of magical power. Isn't that right, girl? And those priests that he's got, I think part of it is that, yeah, their blood is more powerful to use for magic. But I also think Euron, it's quite the political symbol. You know, Euron is one of those characters, we've talked about that. He draws power by defying norms even the Ironborn's own norms. He, it makes him seem outside the law, bigger than everything. That's, he's trying to portray himself as a god-man. And so violating norms is a very important part of that. I hate to make a political analogy, but definitely this is part of the principle of Trump's presidency. You saw, like, no matter how many controversies he had, he would never think about it as a liability because there is a certain perspective where he seemed powerful because he's able to break rules, norms, or even laws and not pay the price. Now, of course, hand of justice works slowly. This shit catches up to you eventually. But politically, he did. He was very effective at um, defying norms to gain political power. You saw that work. And it's a very old political principle. That's nothing new. And that's what you see with Euron. He's working that angle hard. And so we see the vision he gives to Aaron, Dampere, where Euron is on the Iron Throne and all the other gods are impaled on the spikes and he's like, I am your god. It's very clear. He is, he's taking the defying of norms to the fullest extent. He's throwing down the other gods. And again, in the Bloodstone Emperor's tradition, cast down the true gods to worship his black meteor stone. Euron has the sea stone chair. I wouldn't be surprised if Euron's got a friggin' meteor in his pocket. Come on now, he might bust that out. Could Danny take multiple husbands like Aegon the Conqueror? Yes, actually. I don't specifically predict that, but sure.
Oh, would Cersei then get a gold foot? That would be funny. I haven't seen foreshadowing for a gold foot, but... So, what is Euron up to? He's using a bunch of priests and other things to power a sacrifice. He's going to do something big at Old Town. I believe Euron is going to coronate himself at Old Town after this battle. Probably the blood magic is going to be used for the battle. Don't know if he's going to call a kraken. We know he can control winds, so he can probably control waves as well. So you might see thunder and storms and lightning used against the other fleet. You might see a big whirlpool open up. Um, oh, is the chat? Okay. Thank you. You guys, yeah, sometimes the, the chat freezes. Yeah, just let me know if, if that happens. Some, it's hard for me to tell. Okay, so I think Euron calling a Kraken is like secondary. That's not what he's trying to do. I think he'll be summoning like more like a maelstrom to destroy the other fleet. And maybe a Kraken will appear to sort of, you know, add the vibes or whatever. But I don't think he, the end point is to like wake the Kraken, like wake the dragon. And it could be that all the blood magic sacrifice is part of calling Viserion or Rhaegal, I think Viserion, back to the high tower. Like, we know Euron's got some... And yeah, the bird did give me a nose tickle. Uh, we know that Euron is waiting to spring a trap on Victarion. He's given Victarion the horn, and he's told him it can bind dragons. But he obviously has some way of guaranteeing that he's going to get the dragon and not Victarion. We're not sure what that is. Makoro may or may not be being straight with Victarion about how it all works, you know. So, it could be that um, a lot of this blood magic is going to be used to call the dragon back to the high tower. I think that when Silverwing and Alisan land at the top of the high tower and fan the flames of the beacon, that is foreshadowing for Viserion, who is not a silver dragon, but a cream-colored dragon. And all the white, silver, and cream-colored dragons, that's all the same ice dragon symbol so ice dragon landing on top of the high tower and alisan is a knight's queen figure so i think viserion is called back to the top of the high tower that's where euron claims viserion who is the alisan figure in that story it could be the mad maid malora high tower who is at the top of the high tower it's going to be hands of white fire lady we just don't know who that is that could be melisandra down the line it could be danny it could be viserion that was ball the bard's old ideas like hands of white fire lady is this dragon spirit inside viserion wouldn't that be wild but yeah i think that's an important foreshadowing viserion's going to be called to the high tower so it could be that that's what euron's going to use the blood magic for he is going to declare himself king of westeros at old town just as Aegon the conqueror did That's the official coronation of Aegon at Old Town. Okay. Quentin is dead. Oh my God, please. You're on the wrong... I don't want to say you're on the wrong channel, but if you're looking for exploration of that, no, he's dead. Couple reasons why. One, we know for sure... He was engulfed in dragon fire, and that's not something you heal from. All of him was aflame. All of him. With dragon fire. At close range. So he's dead. Barristan wa watched him die. Barristan would know. His friends would know. Yeah, I'm just... I kind of hate that theory. And there's also no plot reason for him to be alive, and every plot reason for him to be dead. It's important that he's dead both politically and thematically. So, not your huckleberry. I'm not, sorry, I don't mean to get worked up about it. It's fine. I don't, I don't really hate any theory. These are just theories. But, yeah, I don't, I don't see any merit to that. I, don't, I give that a 0% chance if I were to put chances on it. I'd be shocked 
Like, I'll come on here and apologize. If Quentin's alive, I'll be like, damn, y'all. I got that one way wrong. I don't know if I'll eat my hat. But I'll definitely, I'll definitely apologize. Because I, I, that's one I feel strongly about. Okay, so next. What do we got? I feel like I probably missed a couple. Do we have any nominations? If I don't have a squisher, again, I will ask, uh, if I don't have a super chat, rather, I'll ask my squishers to give me a category pick. What do you think, girl? Oh, yeah, you want to climb on the banner? You can't. It's a cloth banner. It's not a real church of starry wisdom. It's just a banner. I know. I know. One day we'll have a real church in our backyard. I got to get rich first. And we'll order the oily black stone and we'll build the megalith, girl. I promise. Well, we will. Okay. You guys know I'm a pyramid in my backyard rich guy, right? If I ever get rich. I mean, that's obvious. So, been planning that for a while. John Haymaker. Oh, I, all right. Are oh, you talking about, okay, Quentin. Um, Quentin's father sent him to such peril because all these parents do that. They all shove their children into the Game of Thrones. That's what you do. Well, we got to do Dorkstar before we do Skagos. Okay, well, like, both of them are picked at once. So here we go. Unsolved Mysteries for 200. Dorkstar. Where are we, Dorkstar? Who is Dorkstar? That's the question. We know he's going to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, so Preston Jacobs is the Quentin is Alive guy. So, yeah, totally. If If Quentin is Alive... I will I will apologize to Preston, even though we don't have like a beef about that. I'll definitely give him I'll give him flowers. I guess is the way to say it. Will Danny torch any other? Qu- okay, so I've got that question. That's in the second tier, Gerald Garcia. Good good call. That's in there. We'll get to that. Um, let's see here. Dork Star. So who is he? Some people think he's like a secret Targaryen. I don't think so. Most of the people that think he's a secret Targaryen think that because he has silver hair. And Aryan says he looks like a dragon lord. And he has dark purple eyes. He sounds like a Targaryen. The thing is, Ashara Dane had purple eyes also. And Edric Dane has uh, blue purple eyes and uh, ash hair, which is a kind of silvery looking... It's in that family. So, uh, Chicken Lipstick, to get your own question in the box, uh, PayPal. I should keep saying that periodically. Send a PayPal uh, with your question, and we'll add it into the uh, your name here. Quentin is a Night's Queen figure. <laughs> you just Now you're making fun of me. You're having sport with my archetypes. I need another, I need to praise Garth again. Oh, I I need a poker too. Poker for this ash. Cleo, where's my poker girl? Oh, okay. I know what I can use. And no, I don't, I think Volantis is the main one she's going to torch, just to answer that part of it. I'll come back to the rest of that question, but... So who is Dark Star? Let me hear from the chat. Do you guys think Dark Star is anybody important? Is his identity important? Is he just a Dane cousin that was invented because of the five-year gap? That's what I think. I think that when when George Martin was planning on using the five-year gap, it was going to be Ned Dane, who was going to be 18 after the gap, 19, and he was going to be named Sword of the Morning. And so he would be given Dawn. He would bring Dawn out into the fray towards the end of the story and ultimately probably end up dying in battle so that Dawn could wind up in the hands of John. So Edric Dane's role is to get Dawn out of Starfall. 
Once the five-year gap was scrapped, he is now too young to be named Sword of the Morning. So instead of inventing a slightly older cousin, just an older version of Edric Dane, we got Darkstar in book four, when we've never heard anything. There's no Darkstar before book four. It's a new idea George had. So it's like, well, why is Darkstar in there? Because he can serve the same role, which is get Dawn out of Starfall. He's just not going to do it the same way. He's going to steal it. It's actually a better idea for him to steal it and then join Fagon's Kingsguard. Fagon's looking for legitimacy. So this is like the next, this is like an echo of Arthur Dane. Fagon is supposed to be Rhaegar's son. Arthur Dane was Rhaegar's best friend. So here we have another Dane, Sword of the Morning in the Kingsguard. He'll eat it up. Step down. I do think the Danes come from the Empire of the Dawn. Yeah, that's why they have Dawn. Because Dawn as a sword is anachronistic. It, it doesn't fit any other First Men technology. It's not a First Men thing. It's, it's weird. It doesn't belong in Westeros. Cleo is so pretty. That's right, aren't you, girl? So, is Darkstar somebody? I think he's just a cousin. I am curious to see how he's related and f to fill out that Dane family tree, maybe find out about Ashara. But I don't think he has a, an important secret identity. He was named after Gerald Hightower, obviously. So, yeah. Where's Edric Dane? He's in Starfall. The lyrics to Dark Star are all about the long night. It's about stars crashing and the moon ice petals, you know, revolving and stuff. It's, it's very, it's mythical astronomy, mostly. Dark Star is a Night's King figure. That's why he's going to steal Dawn, guys. This is the other part. The Night's King, it, to the extent that Night's King is like the leader of the others or whatever, like I think he is, he stole Dawn because he caused, he caused a long night. He didn't let the sun come up, so he stole the sunrise. So he stole dawn, right? So I think that that's a joke that George is having and that stealing the sword dawn is going to be a thing. So we're going to get Dark Star. What is Dark Star? Like, the sun is a star, so a dark star is a darkened sun. So his name is Dark Sun, and he's going to steal dawn. Because when the sun is darkened, that's the long night. That's when there is no dawn. So it like, the symbolism foretells it. He's going to steal dawn. And that's going to be a Night King thing. That's why his hair is like a silver glacier. It's supposed to make you think of glaciers and the long night in glaciation. So that's Dark Star. I don't think he is somebody's secret. But some people think he's like eggs. He's like Jaehaerys the Third. Or something he's descendant of egg that got secreted away. But again, I think that's just misinterpreting the Danes having Valerian looks. The Danes have Valerian looks because they're from the Great Empire, the Dawn, not because they're Targaryen. There's, there's Targaryen blood in the House of Dane. So the John Danny romance, I think, will be based more around their shared values and their heritage and magical prophecy and shit. So I think it'll be awesome. But it's not going to be just like cheap romance. Like they're both fighting the, for the end of the world and they just get distracted with Hanky Panky. It's more like going to be like Rhaegar and Lyanna where they share this prophetic destiny. And that's the center of the romance. But it also depends on if what John is like when he's resurrected. Like is he even capable of Hanky Panky? And will Danny also be a white by the time they meet? getting ahead of myself with that question Howland Reed is on there later you better believe it okay so where are we um Oh, don't don't work on my glasses, girl. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pick one to get 
Uh, actually, no. I guess I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. Oh, there's a PayPal. Never mind. Sarah, what do you think the words to the Song of Ice and Fire are? I think the house words are a huge hit. I've got a spreadsheet. Oh, hint. The words to the Song of Ice and Fire. Well, the Song of Ice and Fire is a reference to the prophecy. It may not be word for word the same as what we saw on the show, and it may not be carved into a knife. Although I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Because inscribing runes on Valerian steel is a thing, and Elric has runes on his sword. So, Valerian rune swords would be awesome. But yeah, Ice and Fire, it's the prince that was promised prophecy. We know that because Rhaegar says it in Danny's Undying Vision. She sees Rhaegar saying, you know, his son, his is the song of ice and fire. He's the prince that was promised. Now, he was wrong about it being his son. It's actually John and Danny. But the song of ice and fire, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a conceptual expression of the harmony of opposites. You know, John is descended from the others and the Targaryens. So that's why he's a song of ice and fire. What are the words? I don't know. Um, it sounds like you've got a specific idea based on the house words. So if you want to throw your idea in the chat, I'll be happy to read it. But I don't, um, I can't pick them out of your brain. It sounds like, like I said, you sound like you got a <clears throat> specific idea there. So let's, so squishers, help me out here. Let's clear this board so we can get to the second half. RLJ Zor, High and Sons, Religious Zealots, Headless Ned, Skagos, White Queen. Somebody pick one of those, either with a super chat or a squisher message. Either one will do. Oh, nice emojis, General Grievous. Lonk the Lunk nominates Skagos. <clears throat> Whoop. Got a little head rush. Hang on. Praise Garth. All right. What happens on Skagos? Uh, I think the expression is only weirwoods see half of what goes on on Skagos. Now, cannibalism is everywhere. So, if there's cannibalism on Skagos, that wouldn't really be a surprise. It seems to be part of First Men tradition. It seems to be a part of magical belief. You know, uh, Vermeer eats Hagen's heart believes that he'll draw some amount of strength from it. It's definitely a very common idea in older folkloric belief systems about magic that you can uh, you can take somebody's power by eating them. And Bran is obviously, well, the Jojen paste. It may have Jojen's blood. It may have his brain. I think it's Jojen's brains specifically that he's eating. But check out my Jojen paste video, Where Would Paste His People? So what is going on in Skagos? What's the point? Um, Davos's POV is probably going to pick up on Skagos next time we read it. When we hit open winds and it says Davos at the top, the next line will probably be describing Skagos. So we know that uh, Osha took him there. So let's think about that. Why would Osha take him there? Two reasons. One... Skagos is half wildling anyway. It's a wild place. It could be that the wildlings know a little more about the culture of Skagos than the average Northman. She could even have connections there. She might have some reason, at least, to think that it would be a safe place to run. If she just only knew the tales of Skagos, then you wouldn't take Rickon there at all. But maybe she has... She knows something more about the truth of it. Second reason, Starks are related to Skagosi. Um, 
Ned's grandmother was a Skagosi. The Starks put down a rebellion about a hundred years ago. Barth Blacksword died putting that rebellion down. Barth Blacksword, by the way, named after ice, even though it is very dark smoke gray. It is still a black sword for purposes of symbolism. I always point that out. So seems like maybe after putting that rebellion down, part of the, the peace accord was the Starks take home a, a Skagosi princess, and that is Ned's grandmother. So, yeah, maybe Osha's ex lives there, exactly. So um, maybe Osha is planning on trying to leverage that relationship. Be like, hey, this is the grandchild of one of your great war leaders. The great-grandchild it would be now. So I think that that connection is going to be important. The Stark, Ned's grandmother being a Skagosi. I think that will be a thing. Um... So I think, yeah, I think, of course, Skagos isn't as bad as they say. There probably is some cannibalism. It's probably related to Green Sea or shit. Uh, but that's probably not the main thing. Um, we do know there are the enormous horny goats. We, uh, the, we get a dire wolf vision of a shaggy dog fighting with one. It's got one giant horn and it rakes shaggy dogs on the side there. So... Those, those horny goats are big enough to tangle with a dire wolf. So they're vicious animals. And we're going to see them. And George has said we're going to see them. So I tend to think this again. It's like when it actually happens, it'll be all twisted. But yeah, there will be an army of Skagosi riding on unicorn goats. And Rickon is going to be riding his wolf. With the leaders of the Skagosi, they're probably going to ride on to some battlefield and fuck some shit up. I don't think it's too simple to say that. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, will Rickon live? Less likely, you know? Doesn't seem like there's really a place for him in the story. But hard to say. Hard to say. What do you guys think about Skagos? Is there anything... Ah, is Skagos volcanic? Um, was there any evidence that it's volcanic? I don't know of any. What would be the, what would be the clue about that? And I don't think there's... I don't think the cannibal is lurking around. Like the dragon cannibal, I don't think so. I don't think there's other dragons lurking around. The only other dragon that's lurking around, in my opinion, would be an ice dragon in the heart of winter. I think there are dragon eggs in the Winterfell crypts that John may feel reaching out to him. Got into that in uh, the Aegon's Prophecy videos. Rickon is a bit Tarzan-like, yes. He's very wild. I think there will probably be some very sad end to that. Like, he's going to be too wild, you know... That's going to backfire somehow. He's not the last dark male. Bran is still there. It's fine if the house continues on the female line also. That's totally fine. Doesn't need to be a man. Skag yeah, turn the Skagosi loose on the Boltons. Hell yeah. That would be awesome. Carsnark, be quiet. Yeah, I think Cannibal's just too old. I think Cannibal is too old. Because Cannibal's from like before the Targaryens came to Dragonstone, supposedly. So that's pretty friggin' old. Be like more than 300 years old. So. Is Skagos a place that the old ways and the truth of the long night has survived? Maybe a place for Rickon to become the most powerful Stark skin changer. Well, I do think he'll be a very powerful skin changer. They'll have folk tales about the long night like everyone else. You know, maybe they'll put a little more stock in, in their Nan's words than the average. But I don't know if they'll have too much secret truth. I think Bran's going to discover the secret truth with the Weirbed Net.
All right, we need to move a little faster here. Yeah, I, all the houses pass through daughters sometimes. Um, right, Bale the Bard claims his story is that it, that happened as well, yeah. Could Rickon join the watch mirroring Benjen? Doesn't Rickon kind of remind y'all of Biter? <laughs> I don't know if he's that feral. Maybe Cannibal's eggs are on Skagos. I just don't know what the link is other than the name is Cannibal and there's Cannibals on Skagos. I don't, just not sure what it would be. Thank you, Long to Lunk. All right, Headless Ned it is. Headless Ned. So, Ned's head's been chopped off. Ned's dead. And his bones are being sent back to Winterfell. But Lady, Lady Barbara Dustin has other plans, as she has told Theon. She's very fixated on de defiling and dishonoring those bones. Or maybe sleeping with them and doing naughty things with I don't know Lady Barbie's kind of messed up um so uh the question is will Ned's bones make it back to Winterfell be interred in the crypts and then when the long night comes and all the stark zombies rise from the crypts will there be a headless Ned White Ned a white without a head walking around. And I think this is an actual theory. And the idea is like Robert Strong is foreshadowing it, you know, because Robert Strong might not have a head. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a funny one. I, I don't think so. But let me ask you this. Why? What is this whole thing with Ned's bones? Is it just a plot point for Lady Barbary so that we know like how obsessed she is? Or are the bones important? It, it kind of seems like the bones might be important. It, this tradition of putting the Starks in the crypts is, you know, they've been doing it for 8,000 years and they talk about the vengeful spirits and all that stuff. Um, so it could be that they're pro protected by enchantment so they can't be whited. It could be that... Well, I think... I think there are weirwood thrones. Like the oldest Stark kings would have been green seers. And I believe that inside the sepulchers in the lowest levels are weirwood thrones and green seers, just like down in Blood Raven's cave, where you see the children, the older ones that are like farther gone than Blood Raven, and they're barely there. Well, eventually they're going to be not there. They're just going to be skeletons wrapped in roots. And I believe that is what is in the crypts at the lowest levels in the oldest tombs. Our green seer skeletons wrapped in roots. So. Ned is not back at the crypts yet. No. No, because Barbary was talking about, like, if whenever his bones... They're in the neck. They're in the swamp. There's a lot of shit in the swamp. Helen Reed's there. Um, I think the, one of the Mormont daughters, I think it's Daisy. And one of the Umbers... Great John or Small John, one or the other. Whichever one didn't die at the Red Wedding. Rob's will. It's all stuck at uh, in the swamp. Thank you, Britain. Britain. We'll do religious zealots. That's yeah, that's a good one. So that's that's headless Ned. I don't. I I think it's mostly a joke one. I don't think. Uh, I don't know. I think it's mostly a poetic thing. Like, Ned's bones coming to rest will feel good emotionally. I don't know if it's a magical plot point, but... Cool, new. we'll do Hand of the Queen after Religious Zealots. Perfect. So, Religious Zealots, there's two groups of them. We got your Relorists and the Stars. Well, the whole faith, really. Religious zealots, there we go. Um, you know, in Volantis, Danny's definitely going to burn Volantis, and waiting for her in Volantis are a bunch of Relorists, like the, the adherents of the religion. Most of the slaves in Volantis worst follow Relore. And there's the widow of the waterfront saying, We're waiting, you know, to, you know tell her to come quick. So basically, there's a, there's a slave revolt brewing in Volantis. 
it's going to revolve around the Red Temple. The Red Temple is openly preaching against the the high the high you know the uh, the royalty of Volantis because they're not helping Danny. Uh, the the Red Temple is decidedly pro Danny. They are waiting for her. They are her army in waiting. They think she's Azor High. So when she shows up to Volantis and burns all the assholes inside the Black Walls. She will then gain herself an army of Valorist fanatics. Who she will bring to Westeros. So, we're going to have the fanatics of the faith running around. And they're already on a kind of holy war. And this is, again, the kind of destabilization of politics that comes with winter. The, the reason why their movement has been catalyzed is because they have allowed the realm to fall into disrepair. And now it's turning into autumn and winter and people don't have food already and they're just showing up in King's Landing because their farms have been burned. They don't have crops to harvest. So they know they're going to be fucked for winter. So you're going to have Reloris and these stars and swords of the faith and uh, it could really be a mess. It could really be a mess. Plus Fagon has his own not religious fanatics, but he's got his own groups of people that have their own beliefs and stuff. So, yeah, where are my old god zealots? <laughs> Borok. Borok and his bo and his boar. Varamir Sixkins. So I think that um, the Reloris will not be, obviously this will be a thing where all the Westerosi will be like, who are these foreigners? They're different. They got weird flame tattoos on their face. Like that Bam Bam Bigelow guy. So they'll be distrusted. But obviously the the fanatics of the faith are kind of currently causing everybody problems. So then when you throw in like the grayscale plague that's going to break out in King's Landing, George is just creating the opportunity for so much chaos. Just, it's going to get wild. As the law and order breaks down and all these fanatics are running around with different agendas and people are starving. Oh, man. Favorite Theon chapter is the one where he goes to Moat Kaelin or the Winterfell, you know, the Prince of Winterfell. But all, all Theon's dance chapters are incredible. So that's religious zealots. Oh yeah, Aaron is a zealot. That's true. Aaron is a zealot, and he he might be converted to worship of his brother by the time he's done with him. But otherwise, he could potentially try to recruit the Ironborn to lead a movement against Euron. That's more of an end of the story thing. So I don't know that Euron's fanaticism will be as much of a plot point for anybody. I mean, sorry, Aaron. That's a plot point personally for Aaron. Like, he's the fanatic. The Drowned Men, they're just ironborn, you know, really. So, they're symbolic whites and others, but that's neither here nor there. So, Hand of the Queen. Hand of the Queen is Tyrion. And I won't go into this too at length. Quinn and I did a video called Hand of the Queen in our Winds of Winter preview series. But basically the question is what kind of t advisor will Tyrion be for Danny? And I think this is an important thing that I found when I was looking over Danny's character right after season 8 and I was like, "Danny wouldn't do that, would she?" And yeah, she wouldn't, obviously, you know, burn innocent civilians for the heck of it or for any reason. Um but they had it really all backwards, I realized. Tyrion is the one trying to counsel Danny towards peace. And he's trying to make up with Cersei and all this crap. That's not Tyrion at all. Tyrion in the books is consumed with vengeance and hatred more than any character. Like, that's his whole thing. There could be another part of his arc to come, but that is not just going to disappear. So, what you can see here is that 
Oh, the Faith Militant Crusade to retake Old Town from Euron. That's a great idea. A theory of Ice and Fire. I like that. That does make sense. Maybe Fagon will promise that to the Faith to get their allegiance. That would make sense. Plus, if Euron declares himself king at Old Town, then he's a rival king to Fagon, and Fagon would have to deal with that. So, yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to think about that a little more. So, so basically, Tyrion, he's useful to Danny because he knows so much about Westeros. He knows a lot about the people that she'll be on the other side of the battlefield from and the political chessboard. But Tyrion hates those people. So he will be counseling Danny towards more violent options, most likely, when, when they make sense strategically. And when it comes down to the people of King's Landing, Tyrion has a big grudge against the people of King's Landing. Like, look at that speech he gave at his trial. He felt betrayed by all of them. Like, ah, I protected you guys. I saved you during the Battle of the Blackwater. Didn't get any credit. Was removed his hand. And now you guys go back to treating me like a stepchild. So fuck you guys. I wish I was the monster you thought I was. So Tyrion's not going to have any pity for the people of King's Landing. He promised to burn the Vale of Arryn. That's true. So essentially, if Danny's dragons set off wildfire accidentally in King's Landing, you could see Tyrion, like, not warning her about it. Or maybe encouraging her to press an attack that he knows might set off wildfire. He, he could have a hand in helping that accident happen because of his vengeance. So he'll be an effective hand strategically, but I think that's the point of making him villainous is that like he's someone Danny can't trust all the way. And his counsel may be part of the reason why people turn against Danny. So, I think it'll be a mixed bag. And there's the link for the Hand of the Dragon video. Thanks, Carl Karsnark. Okay, so RLJ Zorhai and Sons. No one picked it. You should have picked it. Because... Oh, I missed um religious zealots was a was a daily double. Kind of late now, but yeah, that was my idea. Okay, um, RLJ Zor High and Sons. It just sounds like a law firm. But what we're talking about here is John. We already got into it earlier, so we can go quick. But what kind of white will he be? And I've spent a lot of time talking about his pyre and all this stuff. I, I have really settled on the idea that he's going to be stolen by the others and ice whited. And that this is how you get a cold hands. Cold hands looks like an ice white, but he's not enchanted by the blue eye, you know, uh, blue star eye magic of the others. But he had to have been ice whited because his body is frozen. So I think John will be ice whited. Oh, you picked it, Minty. Thank you. Well, that makes me feel good because that was my idea. All right, so he's going to be ice whited first, but then he's going to be freed from that enchantment, which, like, uh, I think I think he'll have inner fire. So that vision where he's defending the wall with the burning red sword, his body's armored in black ice, but his sword burns red. And the burning sword, like I said, that's you make a burning sword if you're a fire white. That's who can make a burning sword. So, John probably will have fiery blood, but it'll be inside that cold body. So, he will be a white of ice and fire. I do think so. With white hair. It's going to look really cool. John's going to be so cool. He's got to level up, really, to be worthy of Daenerys, to be honest. So, that's what this is about. White Queen in honor of my ex. Ooh, that's that's cold. That's real cold. Frosty. <laughs> White Queen. 
Where is she? Where's that one? Oh, it's going to be down here. That is a daily double. Bleep, 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 bleep. I gotta get. I gotta love my sound. I'm so unhappy. That's not the right vibe. I need something obnoxious. The theremin would have been good for this. Say la vie. Okay, white queen Cleo. Hang on, girl. Should we talk about pink queens instead? The white queen is Danny. Actually, no. the The question is, will we have a white queen? Meaning, a whiteified queen. Will Melisandre become a white? Will Danny? Cersei, anybody else, <laughs> Marjorie. I do think Danny will end up being resurrected because John is resurrected and Azor High sounds like a resurrected dude. So the question is, where do you think it will happen with Danny? Um, Mokoro is a red priest who will be waiting for her in Mirene. So potentially Mokoro could resurrect her. Or it could happen later in Westeros. I don't think it will happen at the Mother of Mountains. Because there's no Red Priest there, for one thing. And because I think that's not going to be just the moment. But what if she's assassinated when she comes back to Meereen and then resurrected before she comes home? It's either that or it happens in Westeros. And it would be um, Melisandre, perhaps. But Melisandre is resurrecting John, So I don't think that's it. I think this might be why Makoro is in Marine. So what do you think? You think Danny, oh, Quaid. Yeah, Quaid, I guess Quaid could resurrect Danny. Absolutely. As a shadow binder. Maybe that's a more obvious choice. And it could be that there's a lot of foreshadowing Danny will blow dragon binder. So maybe she'll be resurrected first. And that's why Dragonbinder won't kill her. Val could be... She literally is a white queen. Could Val be whited? Yeah, I could see that. I could see her being whited. Fire or ice whited, really. That would be a shame if she was ice whited. Some people think Val is actually like an ice priestess and she's like got magic up her sleeve. I haven't seen any signs of that. She just has the vibe, really. But I don't know that she is a magician. What do you guys think, Chad? Do you think Val has magic? She certainly knows about magic. But does she have magic? I should have made that one. Well, that's okay. It's part of White Queen. Quave is Danny. Yeah, I don't think so. I think Quave is either Alyssa Farman or Shara Seastar. Either one would be poetic and would make sense. Kinvara is on the show. She's not in the books. And also, is Euron's Hands of White Fire Lady... Is that a fire whited Daenerys or somebody else? That could be also. Like it makes sense. Cause that's that's a person that might appear as a, a burning spirit in a vision. Their dream form could be somebody with hands of fire. That makes sense. Especially since Relore has got the burning hand symbol. Yeah, I don't think Sansa is going to be undead. Oh yeah, Benero. Benero's in Volantis. So Danny's going to pick up Benero there. That could be... I could see it happening in Volantis that Danny's resurrected. That would make sense, actually. She burns Volantis... But like, falls off her dragon, or there's some moment where we're like, "Oh God, what's happened to Danny?" And then, uh, fucking, Benero resurrects her in the Temple of Relor, and then like all the Relorists are just, she's a god now. 
Yeah, that kind of makes more sense to me than Meereen. And I do think she'll die at the end uh, for good, giving up her life to save the world. I think that's where it's going. Um, yeah, once you become a white, you, don't, you can't go back to living a happy life. If John lives, it'll be as the next cold hands, wandering the north forever. You know, something like that. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, all you guys missed was me just typing up these next questions. That's all. That's all. These are the new questions. Feast your eyes. I said, check them out. And then I stepped away. So we're on the same page here. We got it going on. These are new ones. So here's what we got. Plots and plans. We've got Schadenfreude Sandwich. Red Wedding Redux. Castle Black Attack. In Unsolved Mysteries, we have Paging Howland Reed, Summer Hall, and The Long Night. Man, the chat is so far behind. I've been muted so long. <laughs> well, Francis, the mute. Well, I'm not muted now. How long, how far behind is the bloody chat? All right. It looks like it's about a minute behind, so I couldn't have been muted for more than that. Television has commercials. I have mutes. So, paging, paging Helen Reed, Summer Hall, and The Long Night. These are in the Unsolved Mysteries. Body Parts. We got Preggers, Queens. How Hot the Hand and How Cold the Hands. Politics. We've got Empress of the East, Mad King Fagon. My name is Fagon. And Rob's Will. And then we've got Death. We've got Witch Door, Queen of Ashes, and Popsicle Factory. Somebody get it started. I either need a super chat from one of y'all non-squishers, or if you're a squisher, go ahead and pick. Minty Maelstrom wants Empress of the East. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. So this is a specific question about Danny. The question was phrased as a hypothetical, but it's a good thought experiment. Basically, is it going to be that like she would be con once she hears about Fagon, like let's say she gets to Volantis, Fagon will have taken King's Landing by then. At some point before Danny gets to Westeros, she's going to hear Rhaegar's son has returned. And has taken the throne. So we got to wonder, what is going to be her reaction to that? Part of her might feel like, oh, this is a rival. I would expect she would be glad to think that Rhaegar's son is alive somehow. It's pronounced true gun. So the question is, is the scenario going to end up like, ah, uh, Danny's not even going to want to take King's Landing and she would be content to stay in the East except for th that she hears about the Long Night or like uses her glass candle to understand that she's got to be, you know, to take her dragons to Westeros to fight the others. And is that going to be the only reason that she comes to Westeros? 
Um, alternately, is there any sort of ending for Danny where she doesn't sacrifice herself but goes back east? I don't think so. Um, it would make a certain amount of sense if you want to give her a happy ending, but I just don't think that's her role. I think that she is the cleansing fire that paves the way for the new crop, the new spring. Because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be burned. <clears throat> so that's that's what I'm talking about with Empress of the East. Is the idea of Danny staying there and ruling, is that going to be used as a plot point? Either as something Danny considers doing or you know, does Fagon try to negotiate with her and be like, you know, go back to Marine and rule and we shall be friends. But if you stay here, I will war upon you. <clears throat> All right, so next up, sorry for drinking loudly into the microphone. I try to not do that. Let me undo Empress of the East. Paging Howland Reed. Nice, Kyle. Thank you. Yeah, it was the... When I went to Unsolved Mysteries, that was like the first one. Paging Howland Reed. So, George has said, there are some people who know too much, and that is why we don't get them as POVs, or we don't see more from them. Bran has just become somebody nice and new, thanks. Who knows too much? And so we only got three Bran chapters in dance. We only got one male chapter because she knows a lot. Do you do any drugs other than heroin? No, only weed. Only only the green. That's it. No, no heroin. <laughs> Heroin's bad. Um uh, let's see here. Uh so what is Howland's role? Is is it just RLJ? Is it just political? I don't think so. Howland Reed supposedly went to the Isle of Faces, if you recall. That's part of the story. Is that he went out to the Isle of Faces during that whole uh, Harrenhal tourney. And he obviously, his son is a dreamer, Jojen. And he saved Ned's ass at the Tower of Joy, and we don't know how. So, essentially that means he almost surely has magic knowledge or maybe magical ability himself. Um, I think more than RLJ, it's like, it's everything around RLJ. It's like, what were Rhaegar and Leanna doing? The prophecy, the others, Howland Reed would be in on whatever that secret is. So, um, he's got a lot to say to somebody. <laughs> but when is, how is he going to emerge? You know, I don't hate the, the theory that he's the high sparrow. I haven't looked at it in a long time to remember how solid it is. That would be pretty dope if he was running the game like that. I mean... I think that's the main attraction to the theory is like the idea itself is delightful. But I think Howland, I mean, we've got to see him at some point. No, Dark Sister's up at the wall. But how's he going to come out? How's it going to happen? I don't have a guess. I wish I did. Like, I do think that he blow darted Arthur Dane. Like, I think that's what he did at the Tower of Joy. He used a poisoned weapon. Probably a blow dart. That's what they got. Or maybe a poisoned blade. Or an arrow. One of those things. Howland Reed Theory Iceberg. Dark Sister... Um, Blood Raven took it to the wall with him, so it is probably in the cave with Blood Raven. Bran will probably bring it back. Mira will probably bring it back. Howland Reed, the other thing he has is like knowledge about Ned that Ned has kept secret. 
So this could be a cathartic moment for the Stark kids to speak with Howland. Maybe even not until the end of the story. But it's pathos, potentially, that he offers as well. So I, I kind of think that, like, RLJ, there's so many other ways it could come out. I don't know if Howland Reed is the way that RLJ is going to come out. I think that his role is almost more emotional. Just as the mother of Jojen, or the, the father of Jojen and Mira, and as Ned's, the guy who saved Ned's life. That's a lot. That's a lot of heavy emotions tied to this guy. So I don't think it'll just be raw information. Schadenfreude Sandwich, a new asked for. So this question, this is aimed at D&D. &D. They're the one who eat the sandwich. Or maybe it's us that eat the sandwich. Yeah, that's it. The question is, will Winds of Winter give us enough information for people to be able to clearly see that the TV show ending is not the book ending? And you shouldn't need that because both Dave and Dan and George Martin have said over and over in many different ways that the TV show ending is something that Dave and Dan did based sometimes on some of the stuff that George told him about his ending back after season three, which was like 10 years ago. And George, uh, Dave and Dan would have changed. And thanks for dropping through Minty. Dave and Dan would have changed a few things. And they have said there's certain stuff they got from George and certain things they made up. The John and Danny is something they made up. The Mad Queen arc is something they made up. So the the Danny stuff, I think we will. We'll see what happens. We'll see Danny at King's Landing probably before the end of T-Wow. Like I said, I think she will attempt to take King's Landing. I think Wildfire will go off. So again, parallel to Stannis. I think that she will get blamed. But at no time will she be murdering innocent people. So I think that we'll see King's Landing play out differently. We'll also see Fagon and Cersei fight over King's Landing before Danny ever gets there. And Cersei is probably going to set some wildfire off too. And John Connington is running around, very desperate. He's got grayscale, and he could have his whole world crushed if he finds out Fagon is fake. Do I think Howland Reed is a three-eyed crow and not Blood Raven? No. I think the three-eyed crow is Blood Raven, and the only other possibility is like the voice of the Weirwood Net, which would be Nissa Nissa. But no. I don't think it's time-traveling Bran, although it's not a bad idea. I guess, no, I guess there's some possibility it could be Bran, talking to himself. Yes, John killing Danny was Dave and Dan's idea. I've made several videos about it. I'm always happy to tell more people about this. Not enough people know how clear it is. The words are that everyone has put on record. So, yeah, I've got, check out, there's two videos. I've got one, John and Danny are the heroes of Ice and Fire. That's the short one. And then I've got Who is the Real Danny? And that's an hour and a half of like exploring her book character and showing Eight Ways from Sunday why the book character would never uh, resolve the way that the show character did. So. Good news. Yeah, Danny's not going to go mad. Um, she will be walking the line of like how to use violence and. It, because she's the one who's born to wield the dragons. The dragons are incredibly violent. Um, and the ultimate purpose for them is to fight the others. Using the dragons to win wars against other armies would turn Danny into a monster. I'm just pretty sure she's going to like stare that one in the face and go, ah, okay, yeah, okay, no, these ice demons are probably... Because the thing is, her whole approach to ruling is not one of entitlement but one of like protection. She wants to protect her people. That's why she does the things she does over and over again. So once she sees that the way to protect the people of Westeros, who will she, she would be thinking as her people if she wants to be queen, is to go fight the others. And that's exactly what Stannis realizes. He's like, ah, if I want to be king, 
I need to earn it. I need to go save the realm. Then I'll be king. Okay, so sim same thing applies to Danny, and I would expect her uh, to see that. Oh, thank you, Christy. Kirsty, sorry. Let's see. So I do think Winds of Wit, to finish up, I do think Winds will give us enough to see that a lot of things are going to be very different. And also, Fag like I said, Fagon's not even in the show. So when people watch Fagon and Cersei fight over King's Landing and destroy half the city, they're going to be like, oh, well, that's different. <clears throat> oh, God, it was way back. Orane Waters, Fagon's master of ships, 100%. Yes, if Fagon's going to have a whole crew of fakes. Uh, Dark Stars, fake Arthur Dane. Orane Waters kind of looks like Rhaegar. He's a bastard. Yeah, I think Orane Waters could figure into it. Absolutely. I like that. There's one more in that, too. What if being a Chimera, he's got a split personality, and he's actually responsible for the Cat's Paw assassin? Who are you talking about, Kirsty? Who's a Chimera? And who's actually responsible for the cat's paws? I'm totally confused. I'm scrolling. Is there some other part of this conversation? Uh, if you could just clarify, Kirsty. Tyrion. Oh, not a chimera. Um, he's got heterochromia. Um... <laughs> Uh, what was the, so if, oh, okay, so this is Tyrion Durden, no, I don't think so, I do like the Theon Durden theory, I don't think it's true, it is entertaining, that he is the hooded man, like, the whole encounter he has at Winterfell where someone calls him a kinslayer and he's like, I am not. But that's actually just him talking to himself in the snow. It's funny. You know, like Fight Club. Uh, but no, I don't think so. I don't think so, no. I think Tyrion's pretty self-aware. Well, he's got a couple blind spots, but no. I don't think so. I think the Cat's Paw Assassin is definitely Joffrey's work. I, th I thought that was pretty much confirmed. I mean, it is confirmed. Yeah, George said it's revealed in the books, and it pretty much is. I definitely think it's Joffrey. I haven't thought about that in a long time, but I'm pretty sure that is definitely Joffrey. What if Danny purges King's Landing of Stonemen by burning everyone? Uh, I don't think so. It's pronounced true gun. All right, Squishers, hook me up. Or I'll just pick one. Um, which door? That's the friggin'... This is a cool one. So this is about Hodor. But it's... We know... Okay. We know that the Hodor thing, it's going to be vaguely like it was on the show. Meaning, the reason why Hodor is simple, or whatever you want to say, is because of this time loop moment. Something like that is probably going to happen. Um, it's a little vague. So, like, they said that the Hodor thing was one of the three oh shit moments that George told them about. They were like, oh, my God. Um, but we should assume it might be a little different. So, one of the things that is going to be different is which door. In the, in the books, it, there's a door to get in Blood Ravens. Not in the books, I'm sorry. On the show, there's a door to get in Blood Ravens Cave. It's not really a door in the books there. Um, it's, it's more about the warding spell that the Whites can't break. Uh, now, Cold Hands speaks of a back door entrance to Blood Raven's cave, a sinkhole. And of course, if you watch Preston Jacobs' time traveling brand, he makes a whole big thing out of that sinkhole. Um, Mira has climbing abilities that she hasn't really used except for at the wall that one time. So it's kind of like a Chekhov's gun. Preston was saying, 
you know, if they have to flee, maybe they'll flee up that sinkhole and Mira will have to climb out, which is cool. I think, though, that um, I prefer Quinn from Quinn's Ideas Theory, that it's that underground river and that it's actually Mira's boat weaving skill because the Cranog men can make boats and things out of anything, basically, reeds and shit. And they've got uh, weirwood bark and roots down there, you know. So I think that Mira essentially is going to make a boat and they'll be working the underground river to escape Blood Raven's cave. But the door... I've already already talked about John and Danny. I think they're going to meet... I'll come back to that. Um, the Hodor thing... Hodor's real name is Walder. If you haven't heard this before, it's going to blow your friggin' mind. Okay, hang on one second. I got something in my eye. I don't know if John and Danny will meet in this book, is a short answer. And Quinn, yeah, Quinn does not do Ice and Fire anymore. He's done with it, probably until Winds comes out, last I heard. He's not doing House of the Dragon. That's why he hasn't been around. Uh, but I still talk to him. Yeah, somebody asked me that the other day. Quinn's idea uh, for this was the Underground River. That, yeah, they're going to, Mira's going to make a boat. And that that's how they're going to get back to Winterfell. But this is, yeah, this is the Waldor idea. I believe this is Rusted Revolver from, uh, from Twitter. Hodor's real name is Walder. Okay, and if we're if Hodor refers to hold the door, and that's how we know it's going to be similar, like Hodor's name is a contraction of hold the door. So it is going to be kind of like that, where he's having a seizure or his brain is being scrambled and just keeps repeating, hold the door, hold the door, and it becomes Hodor, and that's all he says. So he's... He's forever repeating hold the door because of this time loop moment. So it's going to be a lot like the show. But the question is, which door is he going to be holding? His real name is Walder. Waldor. Hodor. Waldor. Hodor. Waldor. So it's going to be a door in the wall. Probably the Black Gate. And when you say hold the door, don't literally think about somebody holding a door and like people trying to get through the door and he's holding the door. Holding the door means holding the point, it, the choke point. It could be the passage. It's usually a tunnel passage. That's what it means. It means standing in the breach. You're sacrificing yourself so that other people can escape. That's what Hodor did essentially. He shut the door, held it shut, and allowed himself to die because it bought time. Just like the Spartans in 300. They held the door for Greece. Now we just read, we just read in the, he, or the Sworn Sword, Old Man Eustace is talking about this old story called the Little Lion. And the Little Lion held a bridge against, I think it was a Lannister knight. And he died, but he because he held out so valiantly, he, he was able to, he took out the opponent with his last swing. And once he killed his opponent, then the other side was done. So he won, even though he died. And he did it because he sort of, he didn't hold the door, but he held the bridge. And it was, um, it was a, sorry, it was a river crossing. It was a ford. And so then Dunk, Dunk replays that scene. Dunk being Hodor's ancestor, he holds the door in the stream. He's fighting Lucas Longinch. If he loses that battle, then Eustace loses the dispute and his lands are forfeit. So the whole thing is riding on Dunk, fighting in this ford in the stream. And Eustace goes, remember the little lion before he goes and fights the battle. So it's meant to be a parallel. So Dunk is holding the door in the stream. 
All right. Now here's check this out. So Dunk's Dunk's descendant is going to hold the door. It's probably going to be the knight for it. Black Gate, which means that Hodor will be fighting in the tunnel. They're going to go through, and then the mouth is going to close, and Hodor will have been eaten. He'll be like inside the weirwood. I think that's how it's going to work. I don't think he's going to hold the mouth open. He's going to hold off the enemy while the door shuts. That's how it would make sense. I still got something in my eye. Hang on. Sorry. I'm, it's a bad mute day. I know. I know. I'm so sorry. Okay, look. I gotta wait for the chat to catch up. I was saying, old Nan is like 90. That's what I was answering the question. Um, Dunk would have to be like uh, old Nan's grandson or even great-grandson. Old Nan is 90 to 100 years old. Dunk is pretty young. I'm sorry, Hodor is pretty young. So Hodor would be uh, Nan's grandson. <clears throat> okay, so look. We know that Dunk, who is Hodor's ancestor, saves people at Summer Hall through heroic action. And it's strongly implied it's going to have to do with his foot. Because the whole bit about his foot was going to be chopped off in the Hedge Knight and they talked about, oh, well, maybe my foot will be more important for the realm than Baylor one day. So it's, it, the theory goes, and I don't know whose theory this is, I apologize, but the theory is that Dunk will hold the door at Summer Hall to save some people. I'm down on the most current chats. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll come back to this one. Okay, so look. Duncan, Dunk has that dream of the sand. Him and Egg are drowning in sand. And we just read it recently. And the whole point of it seems to be that it's foreshadowing Summer Hall. Because the, uh, the pyromancers use sand traps as safeguards whenever they handle lots of wildfire. In the Alchemist Guild, they have them built in the ceilings above their warehouses. So the idea is that using so much wildfire at Summer Hall, they may have built in sand traps. And so Egg was trying to do something more crazy. Dunk was trying to stop him. Maybe they just got out of control. Dunk is trying to save Egg in the dream and they're both drowning in sand. We both we know they both died at Summer Hall. So you, you picture how this goes. Dunk saves Rayella, who births Rhaegar, like right outside the castle, and then probably goes back to try to save Egg, and they both die in the sand. So Dunk's going to hold the door in the sand, which makes it a sand door, a sand door, like Sander Clegane, and Sander Clegane he does it with Arya. It's a copy. It's just like Hodor and Bran, Duncan Egg, Hodor and or Sandor and Arya are another copy. And Sandor holds the door at the twins and escapes with Arya. 
essentially, just as, um, you know, the hold the door people are always like, Hodor is going to save Bran by holding the door. So, I got to look at Sandor's story more and look if there's some foreshadowing for Hodor. But I bet there is, because Dunk is going to hold the sand door and Hodor is going to hold the wall door. That's my case. Oh, it's good stuff. I thought of that last night. Thought of that last night. So which door? That was that was mad. Okay, guys. Let me go back to this super chat. And then I need another super chat or something to uh, pick another pick another cue. Keep me going. Lady Lils. Okay, so like I said, John and Danny, they're mostly going to bond over shared values. They're both revolutionaries um, who lead from the front. And they're going to bond over the shared prophetic need with the others. I like the idea that they will have dream contact before they meet. Here's something new for you. Danny's going to have the glass candle. John's going to be resurrected with ghost spirit inside of him. So they both will be increasingly having more magic, more visions. So it would be cool if they started seeing each other in dreams somehow. Like Danny's already seen the blue rose and she hears a wolf howling. I don't know that John has seen any hints of Danny yet in any of his dreams, but maybe it's there if I go look. It's one of the things I meant to go look for. What do you think is the outcome for the battle for Winterfell? I did a whole video about that. So I will refer you to that one. It's King Brand 4. Oh, yes. Thank you. The phrase come into this. Walder Frey. The Lord of the Crossing. He's holding the door on the river, just like Dunk is fighting in the crossing, remember? And just like the wall is like a frozen river and it's a, a crossing point. So the Lord of the Crossing, that's who holds the wall door. That's why Walder Frey is the Lord of the Crossing. And then when the Frey boys come to Winterfell, they play... That, that that Lord of the Crossing game right in front of the heart tree where they're all like mayhaps this and that. It's basically king of the hill but with, with the crossing. So it's like, yeah, this is a thing that George has spelled out over and over again. The idea that the door will be held at the crossing point which has to be the wall. So it's not going to be Blood Raven's Cave where Hodor holds the door. It's going to be at the wall. For sure. Dunk is Hodor's grandpa or great-grandpa. Correct. 100%. Confirmed. We know that for a fact. That is a fact. So what are we doing next, guys? We can do Red Wedding, Summer Hall, Prager's Queens, Mad King Fagon, or Queen of Ashes. I'll do Queen of Ashes because we've already started that. We've already started talking about that. And oh my god, it's a daily double set off by me. Billy B. I need a different, it's not a daily double, it's a Garth something. I think the moon seemed to be calling John in the first book as he tries to leave and join Rob. I didn't notice that scene. The moon is promising John snow in A Dance with Dragons. But uh, how is it confirmed? Well, George has said that uh, Dunk's descendants are in the book. And Brienne has his shield. And she's super big. And uh, yeah, the Hodor thing is... I mean, you don't really need confirmation. It's Bran's vision of the night tall as Hodor. It's the echoes of holding the door. It's all that stuff. So. 
Hashtag facts. Queen of Ashes. How much stuff will Danny burn? She's going to burn Volantis. She's going to burn the calls for sure. She may have to burn some, some more motherfuckers in Marine, depending on how much Victorian and Tyrion sort of clean up in Barristan. She may have to burn Fagon, some of his troops. So she's going to burn a bunch of shit for sure. She is the cleansing fire. Like I said, we already got into this question a little bit. I just think she's the one you want to trust with that fire. She's already shown the judgment and the self-reflection and the character to handle that as well as anybody. Dunk was a king's guard. That's right. Any of his offspring would not be legally acknowledged. Uh, what do I think of the theory that Wyman manually murdered the three Freys and put them in pies? That's not a theory. That's a fact. <laughs> that definitely happens. Definitely and I think it's awesome. And I think if you read the scene, uh, it's it's a it's a squisher scene. When if you the scene where Wyman is eating the pie, he eats it like so disgustingly, like it's all over his shirt. He's getting seconds. He's shoving it in his face and laughing. When you realize that he is eating a fray and having a great inside joke out of it. It's what it is, essentially. Like, this is a fucked up thing. And of course, all the, um, they have tons of merman symbolism, all those guys. So this is basically like a merling eating his enemy and cackling in glee as he like shovels it down. Like it's, it's so much worse when you think about it that way. Yeah, so. Do I have a Helen Reed video? No. So, Queen of Ashes, yeah. Danny's going to burn a lot of stuff. I do think the King's Landing thing will come down to sort of accidentally setting off wildfire. But she's, she's going to be called that. That's going to be her reputation. Boom. Yeah, Brienne is Dunk Spawn. Yeah, her, she's literally got Dunk's shield. She finds it hanging. Um, or maybe she just talks about seeing it. Uh, but I think she has it. No, yeah, she has it. She has it. It's the tree and shooting star. Somehow Dunk left it at Tarth. We don't know how that happened. But yeah. I do think um, Fagon will marry Ariane. I do think that's true. Cersei is the real queen of the ashes. Yeah, she will be. I do think she's going to do a Sept of Baylor thing. She's going to set off wildfire on purpose. I do think they got that from George. Oh, okay. She sees the shield at Tarth and has somebody paint her a shield to mimic it. So even an echo of Dunk having someone paint the shield. But yeah, she's copying the one she saw in Tarth, which is Dunk's shield. So Dunk goes out that way to fight the th third or fourth Blackfire Rebellion. They put it down at Massey's Hook. So perhaps that's where Tarth comes into everything King's Landing is going to burn like several times over okay Prager's Queens somebody's asking who's going to get pregnant first Danny or Cersei or will either get pregnant and this is kind of a show plot point ah A show plot point. But do you guys think there is anything to that? Do you think there will be... Sorry. Got distracted by something in the chat. Um, do you think there will be a pregnancy? 
if Dana gets pregnant, it's not good. Um, in the sense that like this baby's gonna end up being a magical sacrifice, probably. I don't think there needs to be more Targaryens. I don't think there will be dragons. So it's not like John and Danny need to have a kid to continue the line. I don't think that's it. If they have a kid, it's going to be a magical sacrifice baby. So hopefully they won't have a kid at all. <clears throat> Maybe Danny just has a child. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's going to be more Targaryens after this. I really don't think so. She does think about it a lot. That's true, Lady Lils. That's why I hesitate. I just think she's essentially going to... She transfers her desire for family onto the people that she rules. She's already been doing that. She's giving them the peace and security and freedom she never had. So I feel like her desire for children would just be transferred, transferred onto the, all the people. But... We'll see. And Cersei? I don't think Cersei will be getting pregnant. No. I don't think so. But you guys let me know in the chat if you disagree. Is it possible that Jane kept her baby? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Or that she's pregnant. Not that she kept her baby, but that she's, she is pregnant. Yeah, it's definitely possible. All right, guys, what are we doing next? Come on, let's keep moving. Squishers, help me out. Sorry, I probably shouldn't clap into the mic. Thank you, by the way, if you're new to the channel. I have had some new people finding the channel lately through the Dunkin' Egg videos. So welcome, if you are new. This is how we roll. You found the cool kids, or... I don't know the cool kids, but... We have fun here, let's put it that way. Summer Hall, says Lady Lils. Cersei will have a little kettle black baby. Oh, okay. Okay, that could make sense. I dig that. Summer Hall. The question is, will Summer Hall have any effect on the main story? Or is it just a Dunkin' Egg thing? Uh, will there be some truth about Summer Hall that will come out and wins that will be important? Will Danny find out something about it from Barristan? Something about, you know, Targaryen insanity or prophecy. The idea that Egg was trying to hatch dragons because of prophecy. Is that something Danny needs to understand? What do you think? I'm kind of on two ways of that. And if you think it will, why? Val might be pregnant. Who would Val be pregnant by? I think Danny and Cersei have the most potential there. Because there's, you know, Danny has that potential miscarriage at the end of the dance. And it's just made so much about, oh, you'll never have a child. and But that prophecy seems designed to come true. So, I don't know. Or to be uh, proven wrong. So... Was there maester involvement at Summer Hall? I don't... Maybe. There's room for it. But there doesn't need to be. Like, I think it's enough that it wasn't time to hatch dragon eggs. There was no red comet. So no matter how much fire you use and blood sacrifice, they weren't going to hatch. That's what I think. But, uh, yeah, if there's a maester conspiracy, it would make sense that they would take a hand and sabotage Summer Hall. So it's very possible. When I make my Summer Hall video, I will explore that option. Try to figure it out, if that's a thing. So if Summer Hall is important for the main story, the reveal would be Barristan and Danny, or maybe even Glass Candle and Danny. 
but probably Barristan. I guess Marwin might know something about it, but more likely Barristan. Mad King Fagon says, Kyle, thank you. Let's do Mad King Fagon. I, this, was a, this was a good one that was submitted. Will Fagon go mad with power? The pick up my pieces dwarf scene, as I always call it, shows us a sign that like he's got some of that rage and entitlement. Even though he's been trained, you know, amongst the fisher folk and stuff like that, they try to give him a well rounded education. He does show that entitlement and that rage, a little bit of the Arion bright flame. And he may be Arion's descendant. There is a theory that he's not only a black fire, but also a bright, bright, uh, bright flame. You know, Arion's descendant, because Arion went to Lys for a long time. So, <clears throat> what? Is, how is Fagon gonna go? Like, we know he's the Mummer's Dragon who's gonna be cheered by the crowd. So that implies he's going to take King's Landing from Cersei and be well-received. But once he's given that power, yeah, he also wants to, um... Dude, don't all caps me. Come on, man. Uh, so yeah, see, it's distracting. I don't appreciate that. Fagon also, yeah, he wanted to lead the attack against Storm's End, right? He's like, I'll lead it myself and holds the sword up. It's very an emotional, egotistical thing to do. Not necessarily the best strategy. You can argue that it is strategic because he needs people to see him as a warrior. Uh, but I don't know if that's the reason why he's doing it. What do you mean? And what do you even mean how to manually get away with it? I don't It was easy. Piece of cake, man. Piece of pie. They just waylaid him after they left the castle. And killed him in the woods. And brought him back. Made him into pies. And then Mandalay ate the shit out of him and laughed. But then he also got um, his throat slit open. He might die from that wound. We don't know. So I don't know if you really ever get away with anything. Eating three people is not taboo in the north. No, not really. He didn't violate guest right. He let him leave. He gave him the guest gift and they left. And then he killed them. So that's totally fine. <laughs> Apparently. Because that's the whole rat cook thing. He broke guest right. That's why he was punished. Not for feeding the dude his own children. Okay. So I do think Fagon will be more monstrous behind the scenes even as it looks like he's popular on the outside. Because think about it. It's foretold that he's one of the lies that Danny has to slay. It's not good enough that he just isn't who he says he is. Because royal blood doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary. Blackfires and Targaryens. Who's qualified to sit the throne? George doesn't give a shit about that. So if he's a lie that has to be slain, and the lie is his identity... But if he needs to be slain in a sense like cast down as a false king, then there needs to be actual misrule. There needs to be corruption. There needs to be a reason that he needs to be cast down. So I think he'll be popular and be doing well on the outside, but we will see that corruption on the inside. We will see him turning into a monster. We, we should see enough to realize he'd be another egg on the unworthy or King Ares or something. I do think we'll see that. Maybe he'll be, when he takes the city, maybe he'll be really cruel to his fallen enemies. He'll torture people or something. I could definitely see that. <laughs> I could definitely see that. My name is Fagon. Put him on the rack. All right. Let's do, what if Fagon tries to claim a dragon to prove himself he's a targ and the truth starts to come out? I do think there's a lot of foreshadowing Fagon will be eaten by a dragon. If you know the other character in history that gets eaten by a dragon, Fagon has parallels to that character. And then there's the chessboard thing where Tyrion takes his dragon and 
takes Fagon out with it, with the Black Dragon. So yeah, I do think ultimately Fagon will be eaten by Drogon. It would make sense if the way that it happens is that he tries to claim the dragon and the dragon eats him. And it's like, ah, well, the lie has been slain by the dragon. That would make sense. Danny feeding him to her dragon would probably be a step too far for Danny. But maybe Fagon will have done something horrible to deserve it. So, I think it's really interesting, the Danny Fagon thing and how it's going to go. I made a bit of it in the real Danny video. I did speech bubbles and, hey, Auntie, can I have a dragon? It was fun. Check it out. All right, so um, let's do, what do you guys want to do next? Oh, I have a bong hit pack. Look at me. Praise Garth. And actually, I need to run out of the restroom real quick. I'm sorry. I've been holding it in. I'm dying. Let me give you the funky music. I'll be right back. Sorry that was so quiet again. I turned it up last time and then the the thing was set down uh, uh, real low again. Apologies. I'm not sure why I did that. Well, you know what it sounds like. So, you got the visuals. Apologies. Apologies. Ecam letting me down lately with the chat not updating. I know, Cleo. I know. Okay, so do we have a do we have a request yet? Apologies if you've covered Stannis. I have not covered Stannis already. I talked a little bit about how he foreshadows Danny. Yeah, audio audio problems today, man. Not sure why. Somebody asked if, like, it'd be funny if John got resurrected and then Stannis executed him again. Well, not again, but killed him again. Oh, Red Wedding Redux has been asked a couple times. Okay, cool. Let's talk about that. So, this is in Plots and Plans because this is part of Stoneheart's plan. Family, duty, honor, and revenge. <laughs> Add a fourth one on the list requires that Stoneheart, her objective is basically going to be to try to retake River Run and Winterfell if she can for her family. That it seems to be what she is engineering with the Brotherhood. The downfall of the phrase is the same thing as retaking River Run because it's being held by Aemon Frey, uh, Gemma Lannister's husband, who's very weak. He, but he's, he's the Lord of River Run now. Uh, and, you know, that's who Jamie was talking with there when he was there. And so, essentially, Jamie is now down in Stoneheart's cave. He is going to be forced to help. I think he will end up doing a Trojan horse routine where he will open the doors of River Run from the inside so that the Brotherhood can retake it. 
So Jamie's going to be working against his own Lannisters, kind of here. A certain branch of Lannisters, um, potentially. Or it could be that they will just force Jamie to do something that will allow them an advantage to retaking River Run, send a letter, who knows what. Um, but he, that's Jamie's going to be used so that she can Stoneheart can retake River Run for the Tullys, and there will probably be a massacre. There will be some sort of because the the Brotherhood they're everywhere. Like the singer that's in the tent with Jamie and Edmure Tully is Tom of Sevens, who is a spy for the Brotherhood. He's in Barracks and Stoneheart's cave all the time. And he's also listening to Jamie talk to Edmure Tully. So, like, the Brotherhood Without Banners has had Jamie surrounded for a while. They've got the whole area staked out as far as having people in different places. So, they're set up to have some sort of surprise moment at the Twins or at River Run. More likely at River Run where they really pull the rug out from under the Frey Lannister alliance and there will be a sort of a slaughter. The main thing is it might not be like a repeat of the Red Wedding. It will be payback for the Red Wedding and it will be some kind of slaughter. So I don't know if it'll be at a meal or a wedding, but um, maybe it will be. Is there another wedding uh, coming up? Maybe one of the Freys will have a wedding that'll be involved. Is there supposed to be a, a wedding that this is about. So, a theory of ice and fire, you're saying there is some other foreshadowing for Jamie as a Trojan horse in River Run that you found. That's cool. That's cool. Because I had thought of that myself. So, I'm glad uh, it makes sense. Okay, so it looks like How Hot the Hands should be next. How Hot the Hand. We're talking about Victorian, guys, and this is one that I thought of. Forget the sound. It's, it's, this is one of mine. How Hot the Hand. What is the point of Victorian's fire hand? It's a weird thing. It's not, he's not a fire white. He's not a fire other. He just had an infected hand and Makoro relored it. And now it's smoking and crackling. It's just like a barbecued charcoal hand. Victorian describes it as being stronger than it ever was. So I really find this interesting because it just shows you all the different ways relorism can alter physiology, meaning fire magic. Melisandre is gradually transforming herself by using fire magic into a being that only runs on fire. Makoro and Benero are probably doing the same, and probably anybody that uses it long enough. Then we have fire whites, and then we've got whatever the fucking hand is. It's, it's, a, it's a fiery hand. Yeah, that's the thing, is that the instruments of R'hllor, his soldiers are called the fiery hand. There's a thousand soldiers... They're called the fire hand. It's moon meteor shit. But, um, yeah. So, like, the fact that John's hand is burned is a foreshadowing of him becoming a fire white. When he Once he's a fire white, he will be part of the hand of R'hllor in that he is a soldier of fire. So, Victorian having that fire hand, that kind of same, same symbol. So, I don't know if Victorian's going to die as soon as everyone thinks. He might stick around a little longer than you think. Because what could be the purpose of that fire? It's only two things. One, it's a precedent. Victorian's not going to go fight the others and choke strangle them. But it shows you that Reloris can, can do this to body parts. So maybe Mel will do this at the wall to people. Make, give them fiery hands and body parts to better fight the others. That could be it. Or it could be that Victorian has a long, weird story arc that's going to put him on the Night's Watch at the end, you know. That'd be wild. I think it's more likely that it is a precedent. Um, it just shows you that it can be done because it'll be done again 
by a different red priest. In the same way that, like, we know Mel can resurrect John because we saw Thoros resurrect Beric, and then Beric resurrects Stoneheart. Mel hasn't done a resurrection, but she should be able to. Will Jaime get a fiery hand? I don't think so. But I do think Oathkeeper is going to light on fire. Maybe having the metal hand will help him. I don't know. I think the metal hand would get really hot and end up burning his stump. So maybe that's not good. But yeah, what do you guys have to say about Vic? Are there any Victorian theories that you want to see me discuss? He is kind of fun to read. Oh, able to hold the dragon horn. That's interesting. So it's really breathing. Like the dragon horn burns the horn blower's lungs. But perhaps having that fire hand having some relore physiology, maybe Victorian will be able to blow the horn. Um, see, it would make sense if he were holding a fire sword with the fire hand. That would kind of make sense. Or maybe he could even light a sword on fire with that hand. But he's so far from the north, which is the only place we care about fire swords. So, I don't know. That's why I say it's probably somebody else that's going to get that kind of hand. Okay, so let me pull this one off. Oh, I can't find it all. So what the fuck is it? There it is. Okay, what shall we do next? You guys are getting behind. I want you to be ahead. Long the Lunk has been doing the best so far. He could give Euron a hell of a choke slam for sure. Like he did to that guy who said you can't sail across the Dothraki Sea. He's like, fool, I can. Mayhap Sir can talk about the long night. All right, Eric. Thanks, buddy. So the question here will we get a reveal on the original long night in Winds? I think we all expect the new long night to fall by the end of winds. And that may be all the reveal that we get in the sense of if we see a meteor fall and cause the new long night, then we can assume it was a meteor that did in fact cause the previous long night as the evidence suggests so clearly. But think more about the characters in the story. What do Bran, Danny, and John need to know before the new long night falls? Will they get that information after it falls? Or will they be prepared? I think, you know, the whole point of Marwyn bringing a glass candle to Danny is so that she can use it to gain the truth of a shy that, that Quaid is talking about. Uh, John is going to get information, some information from Lyanna in his dream, his death dream when he completes the Crypt's dream. And Bran is a green seer and can obviously get anything from the weirwood net. I think Bran will see a vision of the hammer of the waters, essentially. He'll see a vision of the falling meteor, and it, the, the sky will take fire. And that'll be our last clue before the actual meteor falls. Because you know George likes to do that. He gives you the cryptic clues, and then right before he does something, he gives you the more obvious clue. Like Grey Wind howling and refusing to go in the twins. It's like, what's wrong, Grey Wind? Don't you want to go into this wedding? Come on! So I think um, that's to be the last foreshadowing for the plebs who haven't picked up on Moon Media Theory. I'm just kidding. Um, Bran will see it. He'll see fire, falling dragon. It'll be a mythical description, but it'll be obvious what it is. Uh, Sandor, Carol wants... I, I'm not, I stopped writing in the your question here, but that's okay. Sander Clegane 
I talked about him yesterday for the Mother's Day stream. I would love to see him become Sansa's sworn sword. I think that would be cool. He talks about, you know, Robert says to Ned, you should get her a dog. She'll, she'll thank you for it. Sandor could be that dog. She lost her wolf. And Sandor uh, talks about what dogs do to wolves. So it would be poetic if he ended up serving the wolf queen. So I really like that idea. I think it would be a good resolution to the whole Beauty and the Beast kind of thing that's going on there. It doesn't seem like they should really connect romantically. But it, Sandor finding honor, an honorable service with Sansa as her loyal, like I, that I could see kind of sticking the landing on those arcs. So um, I don't know if there's Clegane Bowl coming or not. But I do think George is doing interesting things with Sandor. He's a very compelling character. He's a very hurt character, like I was talking about yesterday. In so many ways, he's still the eight-year-old boy or whatever who got his face pushed in in the fire by his abusive older brother, and no one took his side or did anything about it. So. The wall falling marked the start of the long night. Probably, I think the meteor will knock it down. And that's another reason why I think the horn is what summons the meat. Like the idea of the horn of Jorman knocks the wall down. Well, if Dragon Binder is Comet Binder, then it's also the horn of Jorman because it's going to summon the comet that will knock down the wall. I think that's how it's going to work. I don't know which horn it's going to be. But I think one of the magic horns is going to do that. So that's the long night. I think um, I think we are going to find out a lot about it in the Winds of Winter, both because the new Long Night will fall and because I think our heroes need to start learning about it. So I think the Winds of Winter is the book where we're really going to get a lot of information about Azor Hyde, Last Hero. We'll be able to push those theories forward by the time we're done with Winds of Winter, I think. So that would be pretty exciting. Cold hands. That's the one I was going to do. So a couple questions about cold hands. Is cold hands dead? Please don't all caps me. I'm sorry. I'm very overly sensitive about it. But just please don't. You can tag me. That's what you do to get my attention. You got that part. Um, and I... I I don't know what he's waiting for. I, th I think um, it's all about the magic timing, not necessarily Vic. It's more about the dragon. But uh, let me stick with what I was doing. Um, how cold the hands? So is cold hands done? We last left him. He was fighting whites outside Blood Raven's cave. He can't come in Blood Raven's cave. He's a dead thing. So the question is, is he dead? meaning dead permanently, has he been chopped up by the whites? Or is he going to be waiting out there? I think he's still out there. I believe. So then it's, well, what is he going to do? He might help Bran get back to the wall. That's definitely something he could do. But John is going to have to go north of the wall too. So I could see cold hands coming back around to help John and Danny if they go north. I can see that. But he might be done. He might be done. And I do think John will end his story as the new Cold Hands. I think the show gave us a sanitized version of that. Yeah, doubtless, doubtless your caps lock key just got stuck. Doubtless you only took out your knife to cut the meat. And no offense was actually meant. Nah, you're good. So I don't think Cold Hands is anybody recent. They killed him long ago. So he really can't be Arthur Dane. I don't even think he can be one of Blood Raven's raven's teeth. I think that's too recent. The children of the forest live for hundreds of years. When they say they killed him long ago, we're talking thousands of years. 
Cold Hand also speaks the old tongue to the elk as in its debt. When he kills it, he has to put it down. He says its ritualistic words of funeral in the old tongue. And that is a, a good clue that Cold Hands is thousands of years old. I mean, the only people that speak the old tongue are like the Thens and the Giants. Okay? So, you know, Mance speaks a bit of it. So the fact that Cold Hands speaks the old tongue, that means he's really fucking old. He's probably one of the last hero's crew. He might be the last hero. He could be Night's King. That's what I'm about. Let me go grab a couple super chats that went by. Rewatched your real Danny video today. And we know truth being subjective is a big topic. Do you think Danny goes north, but due to a dragon accident, she is hated and seen as burning King's Landing? Yes. She's already, the rumors are already flying about Danny that she's a monster and the Mad King's daughter and all that. So if she attacks King's Landing to any extent, and there's wildfire that goes off, Cleo, she will absolutely be blamed. Everyone else will try to blame her. And she's an easy target because of the Mad King and because she'll have Reloris and Dothraki and whoever else. Unsullied. So yes, I do think that's a thing. She won't be accepted. And she'll have to deal with that. But it's fine, because her true destiny is to uh, go burn the others. So check out the video, Born to Burn the Others. But yes, you're exactly right. Dave and Dan believed the rumors. They're like, yeah, that's true. Rob's will. Thanks, Mikey. Benjen. Yeah, I can't tell you. I don't know about Benjen. Benjen is definitely dead. The only question is, will we see him again? Like, is he whited? The coolest theory about Benjen is that the others have turned him into an other or something like that. But I don't know if that's even a thing that's possible. I do think we'll get an answer. The answer just might be when the army of whites comes and John recognizes Benjen and has to kill him. It's like, oh, that's what happened. Okay, my figures. Rob's will. Okay. Rob's will. Isn't the old tongue what Dunk gave to Nan? Boom! Mike boy. I like your style. Oh, uh, Booner. I, that's right. There was another super. Thanks for reminding me. Appreciate your patience. Could we get a time skip during T-Wow? I don't think so. Not a big one. George's timelines do mess around the chapters aren't concurrent but that's they're only a little off um you know the different povs aren't totally simultaneous they might be a little forward or ahead but i don't think we'll get a sizable time skip no because he he abandoned that with a five-year gap i don't think he's going to go back to that uh the howland reed question we asked already we did that one and i didn't really I didn't really have the greatest answer. My answer was just that he'll end up being more important for his emotional impact on the Starks and the Reeds as opposed to just the RLJ secret because lots those are the sources for that secret. I'm not understanding, Ian, your question about historians. Um, when the characters talk about the past, they just say like a th thousand years. They say very round numbers. They're not citing dates, except for when Danny talks about the Giscari War being 5,000 years ago. That's actually a date. But a lot of them, a lot of them are just, yeah, a thousand years ago, you know, blah, blah, blah. That just means a long time ago. So Rob's will. Cleo, Rob's will. Um, the point of it is that it's going to make John war leader. I do think this is something the show got right slash got from George. John is going to be the king of winter. 
He's archetypally the king of winter. And I do think that's basically who leads the struggle against the others. The last hero in the King of Winter. That's the same person, essentially. Um, and I talked about the King of Winter mythology, how it's like the idea of the King of Winter burning to bring the spring is baked into the mythology. Baked, get it? So John being a fire white makes him a symbolic King of Winter. So I do think he'll actually be acknowledged as the Lord of House Stark and the King of Winter. And I think the will might be a part of that. What I am wanting to know is, are they going to address the fact that he's no longer on the watch? Are they going to acknowledge that he's undead and that's why he's not leading the watch? Or is it the kind of thing where like the long night falls and they just make the head of the watch the, you know, the war leader and so he's the king? But I do think he'll be king in the north, like crowned. Yeah. I just answered the Benjamin question. Did you just tune in? I was saying I think he'll pop up, but as an undead person. No, all those numbers in the Vedas are right, Carl Karstark. All those dates are right. Okay, so... What, do you guys have more specific questions about Rob's will? I basically just think it's going to make John the king of winter... Is there more to it than that? Um, I think it's interesting. So Wyman Manderley has Davos going to get Rickon because Wyman Manderley wants to throw down the Boltons. Come here, girl. And so Rickon is his proxy. Is He needs to have a different candidate to lead the house if he's going to throw down the Boltons. And so, essentially, Wyman would set him up to be regent, himself up to be regent for Rickon. So if the will turns up that names John the head of House Stark and legitimizes him, that would create a potential political conflict in the North. I just don't know if there's time for George to work that angle of a dispute between a Rickon faction and a John faction. But it could come to that. And it also could come to uh, Sansa trying to reclaim Winterfell and John having a claim. It definitely could play that. I don't think it'd be the, quite as petty and stupid as it was on the TV show. But the idea that they could both have a claim to Winterfell. Yeah. You could have Sansa and John and Rickon all with claims. And so I, I do think it seems like George is developing that. What do you guys think? Oh, and then Jane Westerling. Yeah, true. Right. If she's pregnant with Rob's kid, then you've got you've got a whole mess. So yeah, maybe maybe George does want to make that mess. Now there's four claimants. You know. Because you could say, oh, well, when Rob legitimized John, he thought Rickon was dead, and Rickon's not dead. So you could definitely see people saying, well, Rickon's claim still comes before John's. You see how that works? Yeah, George confirmed there won't be a time skip between dance and wins. And we, we already know that, because we've got a bunch of wins chapters. That Theon chapter in Stannis' thing, that's like concurrent with the Castle Black stuff. <clears throat> yeah, John, John and Sansa are not a thing. That's not a thing at all. That's a really stupid TV show based fandom thing. That's not a romance. So the Popsicle Factory That is the night lamp. We're talking about the frozen link. So this is Stannis talk. The, the frozen link that's been carved up with holes like Swiss cheese that Stannis has camped at. It's three miles from Winterfell. There's a bunch of islands in the lake. Some of the islands have trees. And one's got a watchtower. And so they are going to set up a fire somewhere else at the top of a tree, or they're going to make a little wooden watchtower 
and they're going to trick the phrase into thinking, uh, the phrase and or Ramsey's Boltons, into thinking the watchtower is somewhere other than where it is, so that they come out onto the ice. And the weight of the army will then break the ice, and you'll have the people falling through. And that's why it's a popsicle factory. Because once you fall into the frozen lake, you come out a popsicle. Like Harwood Fell, whose lips turn blue. So. Yeah, John wouldn't be allowed to rule since he's a Night's Watch brother. That's why I said they got to address the fact that him being resurrected releases him from his vows. Or they have to vote that it's just necessity and it's important or something. It has to be dealt with. On the show, they didn't deal with it at all. So that's what I was saying. They got to decide how that works. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, the Popsicle Factory is going to work really well. I think it's going to be sick. I think the Night Lamp is a great theory. I think Stannis will essentially, after they get a bunch of their enemies to fall through the ice, then I think they will, um, the Manderleys will help them pull Sutterfuge, where they'll pretend to have captured Stannis, and they'll bring him back into the castle, and then they'll turn around and start fighting from the inside. So it'll be trickery. Yeah. Stannis will pretend to be captured, and he won't be. Um, another Jane Westerling question. I think she may very well be pregnant. Yeah. Because it seems like George is trying to create these different potential Stark heirs. Also, Stannis uh, luring those troops into the ice and turning them into popsicle men, that's just more parallels of, say it with me, Azor High, the Night's King, making the others from the sea pulling them out of the sea, the green sea, and turning them into others. So, pulling them into the green sea, rather. <clears throat> Has Blood Raven warged any viewpoint characters? Not that I... No, I don't think so, no. So the thing is, when a person is skin changed, they, they seize and fight, and you can tell it's going... It doesn't happen subtly. It's not a subtle thing. It's a hostile takeover. So, yeah. Even with Hodor, he fights it the first few times pretty aggressively. Like in the tower. Oh, the ice dragon in the lake. Yeah, so... Ice dragons supposedly melt when they are slain. That is... In ice and that is in the world of ice and fire. That is borrowed from his short story called The Ice Dragon, where the same thing. It's basically an otherish dragon. It's purely made out of ice. And when they are slain, they melt and they disappear. They leave only a very cold pond. Now in the the ice dragon reads very much like a fairy tale that is set in the world of ice and fire. It's a story that old Nan would tell. It sounds vaguely like ice and fire setting, but it's not specifically about any king that we know. So it feels like... So what happens is in this story, the ice dragon, who is a friend to Adara, the main character, this little girl, the ice dragon sa saves the day and melts and leaves behind a cold pond on the sort of farmstead of the main character. That's obviously a Winterfell parallel. So in Winterfell, we've got this cold pond in front of the heart tree. It's inexplicably cold, guys. This is, Winterfell is full of hot springs. All the other ponds are hot, except for the one in front of the weirwood tree. It's cold and it's black. So I love the idea that this is a melted ice dragon. I mean, it very obviously is meant to be a parallel to the melted ice dragon from the story of the ice dragon. Same spot, same pond. It's a cold pond, same thing. It, it definitely is. Will an ice dragon 
rise from that pond? That I do not know. It, it could work very well just as a poetic nod. So it doesn't need to rise from the pond. But it is the explanation for why it's so cold. And I do think there's a chance we will see a classic ice dragon. I've always pictured him flying out of the heart of winter. But, or maybe be stuck in the wall, you know. But maybe, uh, maybe he's in that Winterfell pond. Osha dives in and comes out of the pond, but she's not really a dragon. So last one, Castle Black Attack. This question is, are the others already at the wall on the other side and they are waiting to attack? Is John's death going to trigger their attack? Um, Baroque the boar, I'm not Baroque the boar, Baroque's boar has been rooting around in the lickyard, in the graves. So... The theory is that, and this is Sweet Sunray's theory, that like the others are going to attack Castle Black and their whites are going to rise out of the lickyard in Castle Black and become a problem. I like this idea a lot. I do think the others will try to come and steal John's body as soon as possible. They might be waiting for it. I think as soon as his body is stuck into the ice cell, they'll show up that night to steal it. So, they're close if they're not there. And the idea that they'd attack Castle Black as cover for stealing the body makes sense. They'd send the Whites, freak everybody out, and steal John's body. 100%. I think this is coming. So, yeah, that'd be sick. How do you think the Night Four could play into the attack on the wall? Well, if that's the hold the door location, then this is where Bran is going to cross back. Um, the Night Fork could also, I, I would like it if during the war against the others, maybe Castle Black is abandoned and they rally at the Night Fort. That would make sense to me. I think the original Green Man Watch that became the Night's Watch was at the Night Fort originally. And J George loves to echo that stuff. So the new watch, meaning the army that will fight the others, it should be put together at the Night Fort. That would be a great echo. So that's how it will factor in. Yes, some people think the entire wall is a sleeping ice dragon. It would just be so big, though. 400 miles long. It's kind of big. Is it, is it Lick Yard or Lich Yard? I don't know. I don't hang out in graveyards, so I don't know. Mm, I'm like dizzy with sleep deprivation right now. Oh, it's great. It's like being high only. Kind of like, I don't know, drinking too much cough syrup or something. It's not entirely kosher. Not that I've ever done that. All right. Last call for questions, and then I'll bounce on out of here because it's been a solid three hours plus. So John's, John's resurrection is a two-step thing. He's stolen by the others. The others are going to use him to cross the wall around the time the, the meteor falls or right after. Later, he's got to be freed from that enchantment. And that's when the pyre is going to come into it, I think. Lich. Yeah, okay. Lichyard. Not Lick. The chapter where John has the, he's having a wolf dream and the moon keeps calling out snow to him is one of the clearest foreshadowings of how the new long night is going to fall. It's going to be snow coming down from the moon, meaning meteors that come from the moon that trigger a, an impact winter. Um, 
It's possible that John as ghost will take revenge on the men of the watch who killed John. Yeah, I could see that. I could see ghost going on a little killing spree. I think Mel will figure out that John's in there, though. She will. She has to, in order to pull off what I think she's got to. Um, Dizzy, your question is apt in the sense that, like, George is definitely exploring gender as part of identity. And Arya is experimenting with erasing her entire identity. She has a lot of gender erasure or flipping in her story. Several characters do gender flipping stuff. Arya pretends to be a boy and joins the Night's Watch, obviously. Um, but that's it's more tying into her identity erasure, I would say. Um, so your question is very literal. I would say no. But if there's, that's definitely, um, like, if that's part of your own experience, you could definitely read that in, not read that into, but like, draw the parallels and comparisons to Arya and other, other characters who escape their gender roles in different ways. I do think that's something George is thinking about, yeah. Like, obviously, Brienne is a big one. I don't think Arya's going to get more feminine either. That's a weird analysis, kind of. Um, she's a warg, you know, an assassin. That's probably the way to think about her. But, uh, yeah, I don't know what they say on Twitter. Isn't the moon a giant dragon's egg? No, it's like an egg because it cracked open. And gave birth to moon meteors, which are like dragons. So that's why it's like a dragon's egg. These are, these are parallels. Check out the Nightbringer series, Ian. Who is uh, new to the channel, I must say. Um, she does not use her feminine sexuality in her Mercy chapter. She is exploiting the fact that this guy is attracted to children. I would not say that she's acting feminine. So, uh, I don't think that's that's correct. Am I an anime watcher? No. Absolutely not. I'm kind of against it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. I don't want to open that conversation, but yeah, man. Half the shit I see is just like... Yeah, it's problematic. <clears throat> Let's see here. Yeah, the, and the thing about the gender roles is that um, it's such a confining thing in medieval society, especially, that it's only natural that our characters are going to chafe against it. So that's just, like, if you didn't write that into the story, it'd be weird. It would be a, a censoring of how things work, you know? So... Cool, guys. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up. This has been a nice three hour plus stream. So, uh, yeah, and I agree with what Lonk the Lunk is saying. It's the same thing as, like, you know, people were talking about um, Helena being coded autistic. Um, she pretty obviously is written kind of that way. But she's also somebody who is receiving dreams and visions. And so some people find it problematic, but they have essentially melded those two ideas to show us a character who is only half present in the immediate moment. Um, so it's less important to say, is Helena autistic? Like, What's important is that you can definitely, like, if you're someone that, I'm ADHD, obviously, if you're someone that deals with autism, you could definitely see the comparison and be like, I relate to this character, absolutely. 
That's very valid. And I think it's clear that when they wrote the character, they were sort of using that as a model so that this character really seemed like someone who was different. Um, so it, it also plays on the older idea in shamanism that people with schizophrenia or different conditions that made them different, um, maybe heard voices or stuff like that, were, would make better shamans, that they had one foot in the spirit world, and that's why they're kind of different. Um, there's a variety of ideas about that. And it's obviously not a modern sort of scientifically correct idea, but it is a, a folkloric idea uh, that, that writers could be playing with a little bit. So, yeah. Whenever we're using modern words, like, like I talked about Circe showing traits of narciss narcissism or sociopathy, you can't really diagnose characters conclusively but as a writer, you do draw on things like that because there are narcissists and sociopaths and, and stuff in society. They often do become leaders and they, you know, people who hold power. So you do have to take certain characters and write those traits into their personality. So I think it's pretty solid to look at someone like Cersei and say, oh, this is, these are narcissistic traits. Um, but of course, even you can never diagnose anyone remotely like even in the real world so a fictional character we're only guessing at what the author was sort of using as inspiration i would say but these are fun discussions yeah helena's got it rough i wish people would just listen to her but all right guys take care i will see you um when will I see you next? Definitely next Sunday. We're going to start the uh, mystery night with Tim. I feel like I might do a late night stream this week. We'll see. It'll be a pop-up thing. So stay tuned if you like late night streams. But thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thanks for the super chats. And I will see you soon. Thanks for playing Winds of Winter Jeopardy.